Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. I am Scott in a blustery but sunny South End on sea. And uh, across the screen from me is Callum over there in Basildon. Hello, hello. Hey, hey how are you doing, mate? Yeah, good, man. Yeah, very good. Yeah, um, in an, a similar sort of uh, environment out in the conservatory, so I can actually I can actually see it all. But it's, yeah, very grey and overcast, but uh, yeah, it's a bit of a miserable end to what was quite a, a nice day really yeah weather-wise yeah, beautiful. Weather-wise. <laughs> yeah 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 a bit hectic for you otherwise isn't it a bit of a hectic journey so uh, yeah a bit of a long day yeah um i've uh, yeah as, as you know i set off at about half six this morning from uh from a, a sunny devon and uh made the the trip back home um yeah getting home sort of early afternoon so uh yeah, it's been been a bit of a slog, but uh, yeah. you know, it was yeah, it was worth it. But no, I'm feeling good. I've got my energy drink for what it's worth. Hopefully, it'll <laughs> <laughs> at some point, let's hope at some we'll point it in. may well do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah if I ran we'll, we'll, we'll... a little more than usual, then uh, you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, we both seem to have had a, a nice little week off. Um, That's right. Yeah. yeah. Took the kids and and the, the better half camping for the week. Um, yeah, just yeah. a little bit outside of Ipswich, not too far, but no, really nice. Good yeah, to get definitely. back into nature and spend some yeah. time outdoors and uh, get some absolutely. fresh air, especially out of a screen as well. Yeah, absolutely. Getting my eyes away from a, a computer screen, which is uh, quite nice, and yeah, out into yeah. the yeah, out into the wilderness as it was, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's been a nice, uh, refreshing change. Feel a little bit, a little bit more recharged than normal um yeah, a bit of r and r so yeah exactly yeah so um yeah not uh not too bad ready for yeah. uh yeah ready for tonight's episode of course to get into it yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely but before we do get into it okay. um just want to give a quick shout out to our patreon subscriber that's absolutely. mk ultra yeah um thank you very much and yeah, uh thank you so the uh patreon subscribing the way that it works out for four pound a month you can become and support our uh, our podcast and with that you get early access to the each episode that comes yeah. out and you also get a shout out at the beginning of every episode also absolutely um that's your rambler tier if you want to be a keen rambler however that's six pound per month and with that you get the same benefits that you do as a regular rambler but you also get access to raw video footage of every single recording. Indeed you do. Lucky you. (laughs) You get to see all of this and all of that. You get to hear it and see it. (laughs) And if that's not worth the money, I don't know what is. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And also, they also get to see this wonderful merch that we're now wearing as well. Absolutely, yeah. They also uh, have an opportunity to... Uh, so, uh, to help support us also through the merch store, um, which is le- now live for two weeks. Yeah, um, two, yeah, two weeks, yeah. Yeah, it's a really great quality stuff that's on there. You can get the various different designs we've got. Callum is wearing yeah. the I Heart West Virginia, yeah. as we all do <laughs> love West Virginia. As we all do now, yeah. <laughs> and I'm wearing the regular uh, Cryptid Ramblers podcast logo with the creepy yeah. woodland background as yeah. well. Um, so now we've got that out of the way should we get into it indeed yeah let's get yeah going. so last episode mm. ended on a bit of a crazy note didn't it didn't it just like yeah. what the hell yeah, like, like what? Yeah. just completely outside of uh, outside of the the left field yeah and the team received these crazy emails from this amy from somerset kentucky yeah talking about human sacrifice cannibalism magic. torture yeah. magic yeah. children in mines military cover-ups it all sounded uh, uh well, sounded very pizzagate didn't it to be honest it, it, well, yeah just a, just a tad yeah it's, it sounded very yeah very sort of fantastical in, in that side of things you know like i've mentioned before you know being a you know sort of aspiring author you know that that would have just sent my mind into overdrive with the possible you know story that you could yeah unravel from from just her uh what was it half a dozen emails you know, yeah i which... think i think it was yeah i think they, they went back and forth over the evening like five yeah. or six times 
Yeah. It's absolutely yeah, crazy. And nuts. Yeah. I thought this was all supposed to be about synchronicities and well, the yeah. hunt for, for goblins, which is what it started well, off. Yeah, as. I mean that's the weird thing. I mean, you could have you could be forgiven, you know, for initially thinking that it was about you know a, a group of investigators go, you know going on a, a goblin hunt and then from you know the sort of the latter part of season one into the beginning of season two it then becomes heavily involved with you know synchronicities as you know as you rightly mm. say and then there's just this whole other i don't know even conspiracy cover-up you know sort of mystical goings on with with yeah various parts of, of sort of kentucky so if you sat on any of those fences you know, you could be forgiven for sort of thinking so, but I think, yeah, whichever you thought, I think we're going to end up being wrong as to, as to the, <laughs> yeah. how it eventually does kind of, you know, wrap up at, you know, the end of the season, which is obviously what we're going to go over, you know, um, you know, in this and, episode. Oh my but, God, does it wrap wow. up well, doesn't yeah, it? Doesn't it just, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. Yeah. I'm looking and forward hope, to discussing it definitely. And I'd hope that our listeners as well have, have given Hellier a go by this point. Oh, and absolutely, yeah. We can only cover would, so much. Exactly. Because we're, we're not going to go into absolutely everything because we don't want to take anything no. away from Helia and no. and the team as well because what this what this has done, this series, it's so polarising. It's what I've found where mm. I've been looking at other podcasts that have you know, done a little um, episode on it and, and whatnot. It's incredibly polarising. You've got at one end of the scale, people that are saying, well, they don't find any goblins, one star. It was crap. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know it's yeah. like actually expected yeah. to see goblins. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, like I say, then, you could be given, you know, for thinking that, if you just base it on, you know, the the, the synopsis, you know, the, the marketing and the first few episodes, because the first few episodes of the season one, are taken mm. up heavily by this character or you know this person david christie and and yeah. his emails and he does mention goblins and that is in all honesty i think what drives the team to hellier kentucky mm. so but you quickly realize that it isn't actually going to be about a, a goblin hunt so you know to give it that kind of review i think personally is probably He's, you know, and this is coming from me. <laughs> he's probably quite close-minded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah uh, we've mentioned it before. <laughs> yeah, we have. <laughs> but then, like again, on the complete opposite end of the scale, yeah. you've got these people that are, I would say kind of a little bit like me, where it's the the whole process has kind of changed my perspective on yeah. on all of it, and I'm sure that the listeners can hear that as well yeah. from each. I guess by the end of each episode, yeah, exactly, we've done yeah. the past two episodes we've done so far. It has each time we get to a certain point, it's changed how I think about the world, and yeah, it's it's opened up. And again, this is this hasn't been any different this part of the no, season. It's no, opened up even more questions. For no, absolutely, me. I think as one of the guys say in um, in in season two, you know, when I think it might have been Cole that uh, that says it, you know, when you think that you've had all your leads and you know you're you're done and you know the case has got nothing more to give you know then bam you know you're hit with an, another reference and another link another clue you know yeah. something else unravels which then sends you not on the same path that you were last on but on a completely different path whilst yeah. being about the same thing and that's what i've found quite intriguing with, with the whole thing is that they've had so mm. many so many kind of threads unravel on them yet they've still ended up with a lot of the same you know, we come back to that, you know, infamous word synchronicity. Um, you know that that pulls them, but you know, claws back to previous, I don't know, emails or evidence or you know, cases or or whatever it may be. Um, and it, it almost brings you right back to the you know the whole sort of root of it, which, yeah, as 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 we've said a couple of times, isn't about goblins no, <laughs> crawling really out of a isn't. cave <laughs> i hope that everyone's realized this by now as well. yeah. we're not we're not going to be confirming the uh the existence of goblins necessarily in uh in, in this episode we've, we've already not... done that actually <laughs> about yeah, four yeah, episodes we've... back <laughs> yeah we've done we've done goblins before yeah <laughs> which led it's... us on to this which, yeah, in, a in, whole in, yeah. Of worms. no absolutely no so it's um no, it's it's going to be uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a good one to to sort of 
unravel ourselves mm. and you know and give our own you know thoughts because you know as as i hope we've done in parts one and two you know we're not going to give a a blow for blow account you know as you rightly say we're going to give our own kind of thoughts our own perspectives yeah. how we've kind of interpreted certain aspects and you know rightly or wrongly because you know the beauty of doing this mm -hmm. kind of thing is that you know we we look at the same evidence and the same kind of source material and you know we try and come to our you know our own conclusions i think luckily i say luckily i think for the most part you and i have have sort of gone down different routes but have ultimately come to the you know the same conclusion um, yeah I yeah, don't know how I, it's going to go with this one, but it's. I'm looking forward to finding out. <laughs> well, you know what I'm. What I get rolling with with this sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, like yeah. I, I find myself digging yeah. into a, a hole, and I but sometimes yeah. I struggle to get out of it. But it's. I think that I can completely understand Greg Newkirk's um, uh, hesitancy to get involved yeah. with this sort of thing because. After he received these yeah. emails and uh, he, it was Tyler was then off to go to North Carolina to go and check right. out these coordinates. That was the point at which Greg really started to fear that their it involvement went yeah. beyond just being paranormal, yeah. that there was also a physical human element potentially to this that could yeah. be. A direct threat to yes, them yeah. um and it's i mean i joked about it at the end of the last episode where it all, it all sounds like it's for the greater good and <laughs> you know that somerset sounds like a bit like the town from hot fuzz yeah but exactly yeah it's is that really outside the realms of possibility is it that, that much of a joke that it well can't actually exist you know that's and that's the thing you know it's well i would hope that anyone that is listening to this is aware of bohemian grove that yeah. of the stuff that's gone on at Bohemian Grove and that they ha they do um, worship a god, Moloch, the old, the, the owl god. Mm. Bloody owls again, mate. Yeah, I know, again. Again, Aren't bloody so owls. <laughs> yeah. Bloody barn <laughs> owls. Um, yeah, but it's, it's like they, they do, they, they attend these, mm. <sighs> quote, pagan rituals where they burn an effigy of a child um, and they sacrifice yeah. that effigy of, like to... So these things do happen, yeah. And uh, the, so it's you know, Bohemian Grove, Bohemian Grove is for the higher echelons of our society as well. Yeah. So is something you know? It's not. It's not that far of a stretch to believe that something no. like this could happen in a small town in Kentucky. Yeah. Which has some very very strange anomalies, which we'll go yeah. into later. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's really not outside the realms of possibility, is it? No. No, definitely not. You know, as you say, it's it's there's rituals and you know groups and and organisations that act under the you know the, the pagan banner, um, you mm. know that that carry on with this you know type of thing, and that you know it's highly believed in, and you know it, there's hierarchies and you know all sorts. So when when you watch a documentary like this, you know you can you know to an extent you could be forgiven for thinking that it is possibly made up they are being led down the path or you know that it is sort of fantastical but as you say if you know about these you know these other societies and you know these other groups then you know you've got to sit there and think you know actually it's not that fantastical it's not that you know no. far fetched weird and wonderful whatever because it actually happens you know mm. granted it may not be as you know well documented or you know it might not have the heat that that you know that Hellier has now got or Somerset, Kentucky has now got, but mm. it's certainly there, you know, or up there at least with with that kind of you know phenomena. And you know, yeah. it's not just about the cryptids and goblins. There's now paranormal elements. You know, there's now you know, there's now magic. You know, there's there's rituals yeah. that are being carried out. You know, government conspiracies, military cover-ups, as you know, as you rightly said earlier. So, yeah, and and, and as we know from you know, from, from real life, not even talking about this stuff, that government cover-ups and military involvements are, well, they're happening right now. I'd never mind, yeah. uh, you know, overseas or whatever. So, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's there to be believed. I think you just Definitely. need to, I think you just need to kind of be in that mindset to want to believe it, I think. And that's not just because, you know, you want to believe in magic or you want to believe in cryptids or whatever, but it's 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 hard evidence. It's you know it's real life evidence. Even mm. if you take synchronicities out of it, you know there there is 
some hard evidence there that that kind of does add credibility to a lot of what the team experience so yeah you're right it does it goes far beyond coincidence and just yeah. hearsay with a lot of it like we do know that bohemian grove exists we yeah. you know it was exposed in like the late 90s mm. you know it's but it's something that so many people have are completely unaware of because i think what it is it's that that idea that we've got all, all these films and pro tv programs and everything else that yeah um they're like little seeds of inception of these yeah. ideas that you know normalization of these yeah. sort of concepts and when I mean, we, you see it now with um like with all the UFO information that came out, no one gave a shit about it. Yeah. No one, no one gave a, yeah. no one gave a fucking shit about yeah. it. You know, and it's like, guys, this is this is this is something big. You know, obviously we know UFOs exist. We've yeah. got plenty of footage of it, of, of them. We just don't know what they are. Um, yeah. and this is and it, proof from the governments covering it up for you know, 50, 60 plus years, you know, it's... Uh, since the 40s at the very least, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, at least, yeah, at least since then. So, um, mm. yeah, it's, um, no, it's, 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 it's interesting. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking mm. forward to unravelling the, the latter half of season two and then, yeah, finally sort of coming to our, uh, yeah. our conclusions on it all. So we, we finished up, I suppose it's the end of episode four wasn't it that we, right. that we finished up and so yeah. when we kick back off into episode five this is where the team have really started to understand now that it goes beyond it goes well like what we've already discussed yeah. it goes well beyond goblins and, and telepathy yeah at this point yeah you know it, it, it's it kicks off with tyler he came across this book called um etadorpa um and it was seems like it's quite a synchronous that this thing kept popped up for him as well when he explains a story that basically is it's a story that was written in the 1800s and it's um a gentleman is um contacted by another person who says that they came from inner earth and cut a long story short he goes into the earth and he goes to all these different trials and whatnot. And it turns out that um, Etadorpa is mm. one of these beautiful, glowing uh, female creatures from yeah. deep within deep within the earth that right. doesn't have a particularly large role in, in the actual story, but the story is named after her. Mm. And it turns out that Etadorpa is actually Aphrodite backwards. Backwards, yeah. And Aphrodite is obviously, as we know, the Greek goddess of love, mm. um, but is also associated with Venus, yeah. um, which was the Roman goddess. Um, now, I like what Tyler did here, and it's something that has, has stuck for, with the team throughout, is the idea of a trickster potentially mucking about with them. Mm. And it's good that he finds that connection to Venus, because Venus as we know, has come up a bit in our own research with our previous episodes. Yep. You know, when you take into account um, the Valiant Thor. Yep. Although we came to a conclusion on that one pretty quickly. <laughs> Sharpish, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, Venusians was a very, very strong part of UFO contactee yeah. in the uh, 50s in particular. That's right. um, now, Venus has always been associated with a trickster element or a trickster spirit like for instance yeah. you've got lucifer the light bringer yeah. he is always referred to as morning star which is the planet venus yeah. um, and throughout the bible and the the new and of the old testament he is perceived as a trickster um but what was also quite interesting as well is that he also made this connection from all these facility symbols hmm. now he took the um he went further back from aphrodite into the sumerian goddess ishtar yeah which um again obviously aphrodite and venus were later modeled after and i did a little bit of research as well and i looked into a lot of these other 
um, fertility symbols as well, because yeah. what he does is he sees the similarities in the appearance with these fertility symbols and Alistair Crowley's depiction yeah. of the entity LAM. Um, that's L-A-M. Mm. Um, and you can Google it, guys. Alistair Crowley, LAM, and it's an alien grey all day long. Now, the... Well, they believe that's he, where the alien grey came from, wasn't it? In terms of the modern depiction of, of aliens, they, they believe right. it came from this early draw, drawing, sorry, of, uh, from Crowley about yeah. of Lamb when they said, you know, well, what did it look like? And he drew it. 1917, now, wasn't it? Yeah. And now that has become sort of synonymous, really, with what we all believe to be aliens, basically. Mm. Yeah. The, yeah. the greats, as you rightly said. There are occultists that theorise that that was the... Alistair Crowley opened up a portal in New York in 1917 that allowed these alien greys to come forth into our own world, our own yeah. realm, whatever it, I suppose, whatever it is yeah. you refer to this as. Um, so there are those that believe that Lamb was like the first alien grey that we've ever interacted with, mm. um, which is strange because it that kind of, it doesn't subscribe to the same story that they later go on to with regards to the constellations, yeah. um, which we'll talk about later on. As that involves um, the Orion constellation and Can um, Canis Major. Mm. And now, there's anyone that does know the UFOlogy will um, probably know the significance of those two constellations. But yeah, we'll go through that later. Um, he also looked into the idea of the Green Man because the Green Man again was mentioned in those um, in those emails from Amy and. He also had his own interaction with potentially what could have been a green man carved in a tree um, near those coordinates that that he decided to uh, visit. Right. Now, the green man itself is is a very, very old deity and dates back to like the, the second century and as far afield as like India and they wasn't even Borneo. Yeah. So this is like a worldwide sort of phenomenon um, and is particularly connected with Beltane, which is a Celtic fire festival, which yeah. again was something that Amy mentioned within her emails. Yeah. And yes, yeah. yeah, Beltane is is um again it's a fire festival, but it's also about fertility. It's a very uh, I think Dana says it's a very sensual sort of mm. um festival. There's as there is with a lot of um Celtic and pagan sort of festivals, there's lots of mushroom popping and lots of sex. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> this one just happens to have fire as well. Yeah, so just why not? <laughs> yeah, it burns up in a sh yeah, <laughs> shag like bunnings. You know, it's, <laughs> it's that, that sort of thing. Uh, now, the one thing that I did find interesting in this particular episode is later on, and it's when Carl starts drawing lines across the maps. What did you think about that? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that one I thought was interesting. Um, more so the end result, because I don't think it was ultimately or sort of abundantly clear initially where he was going with it, because he was sort of, mm. as I think we mentioned briefly in the last episode, I know it comes up again or it will come up again later in, in this one, but he was referring to the 37th parallel, wasn't he? And he was, and he was drawing, drawing the lines to follow, um, sort of to follow mm. that and the, the sort of the constellations, wasn't it? And and That's was right. pinpoint in various, well, various parts of Kentucky along, you know, along the line, uh, as well as, and then he, he would sort of stretch it further afield to basically wrap around the globe. And certain, yes. there are a lot of other uh, destinations or well-known locations around the globe that kind of followed this line almost up right, to the point. And like Helia was on that line, wasn't it? And I thought that was yeah, quite... it's the it's the thirty seventh parallel, That's it, yeah. wasn't it? That that they were talking about, and yeah. um, the idea is it's got the um, latitude latitude or grid that That's goes it. right around the entire Earth, and the thirty seventh degree, so yeah. anywhere between thirty six and thirty eight, um, there seems to be a lot of high strangeness yeah. um, 
more and this is we're talking about the northern hemisphere as well here yeah yeah um so in that that band there is a lot of different monuments that can yeah. be found That's right. um then he decided to take a little more little bit more localized and he ended up drawing um five lines mm. now the first line that he did was um kelly kentucky cave city somerset and helia they're all in one single straight line yeah. now um kelly kentucky is re- reference to hopkinsville goblins case Hopkinsville that we in covered, 1955 yeah. yeah um the second line goes um through uh, ashland and wrists coordinates so we just started off with these two lines and he thought right, okay let's let's try a little bit let's go a little bit further afield so um he decided to go from the bridge uh stillwater bridge yeah. and the tin can ufo sightings in minnesota which is um they didn't go into it too heavily but it was um one of john kill's investigations that's right yeah um, but they did look into it and it turns out that line goes straight into point pleasant it did <laughs> so that's that's another strange little i don't know if it's a synchronicity but there's some it's on a well, direct straight line yep got old west virginia yes yeah. west virginia baby <laughs> it's that mountain mama isn't it that's oh, what absolutely. it is <laughs> um so he decides okay well I'll tell you what then i'm going to draw another line um and it turns out point pleasant ashland and somerset all fall in a direct straight line as well yeah then he thought right okay this is this is a bit odd he decided to draw a line that corresponded with the team's movements as well that's right so table rock mountain in uh north carolina which is where they went and had a look for the uh, cave base yeah. in season one. Um, cave City in Kentucky, which is where they eventually did go. And then they went on a Bigfoot hunt a little bit later in Mount Shasta, California. Mm. And that line goes straight over the peak of that. Yeah. Now, this is a direct straight line, but I, I guess it's kind of like... Uh, He, Carl kind of, this is what I like about it as well. He doesn't say, this is it. This is exactly, you know, dead straight line. He's saying that it's hard to draw a straight line over a globe. And there is a little bit of leeway here and there. If you were to put it on a globe, it wouldn't necessarily be a straight line. Yeah. Which Um, is surprising because, you know, as we all know, the earth is flat. So he should be able to quite easily draw a straight line. Fuck you, it's not (laughs) flat, it's hollow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this year this year there's not a true representation of the globe no <laughs> i'm pointing over my left shoulder to anyone that can't Pretty, see I've got yeah. a, an atlas on uh, on my wall yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah we come on man we all know that it's hollow and the north hollow the center of it and they ride on dinosaurs yeah absolutely this is, yeah we know this yeah. that's where that's that's where the reptilians are from that's where they've come from, absolutely. Yeah. That's where old Queen Lizzie the overlords live, resides. Yeah, yeah. that's it. <laughs> but the cave underneath Buckingham Palace. Yeah. That's that's the one. There's an yeah. elevator that goes all the way down. <laughs> 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 um, now, what's really interesting is um, that line four, the Point Pleasant Ashland Somerset line. Yeah. Um, turns out, if you extend it a little bit further past Point Pleasant. It corresponds with the exact mark that Woody Derenberger met Indrid yeah, Cold. Met Indrid Cold, yeah, on that exact highway, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So this is this current this kind of for me. Yeah. This corresponds to um, ley lines and things like that, or yes, yeah, these these power lines, high that energy, are, yeah, yeah, that are said to crisscross right. across the entire planet, almost like. Like a giant ward or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just it's again, it's just too odd not to notice it and not to take notice of it. Yeah, it's a little too convenient for it to be anything else, isn't it? When when you, you draw these sort of lines along this sort of parallel and all these mm. points of interest, you know, pop up, whether it be somewhere that the team have personally investigated or somewhere that they've you know kind of read about or if it bears a you know a high resemblance to 
you know, the case in general, just the fact that they're all on, you know, the same, you know, line and it's all high strangeness and whatever. It's, mm. yeah, it's, um, and it's all falling within that 37 parallel as well. Yeah, exactly. It's all within that. Absolutely. And, and that, and that is pretty much how they kick off episode five, isn't it? Just throw in yeah. all of that after, after yeah. all the emails. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, after all the emails from Amy, when you're still sort of trying to digest that and thinking, bloody hell, like, where, where's this now mm. going? And then Carl's like, yeah, I just, you know, I thought I'd get out a map and just kind of, you know, pinpoint everywhere that we've gone. And I noticed that it followed a line and it was in this 37th parallel. And then I thought, well, what about this? Location? And then it's bang, bang, bang. And as you say, he's got like four or five lines with all these points of interest that run in correlation with one another. And it's like, what? He just started following that lead. And yeah. he's, he's found so much more. It's, it's like, this, for me, I found that this part of the season wasn't necessarily about so much in the way of synchronicity, but more about the connections yes, that yeah. everything seems to have. That it's like, it's almost like when you, you're, as a viewer, you're taking on mm. a bit of a journey, as you're supposed to do with, with documentaries yeah. like this. And, huge respect to Carl Pfeiffer for directing and producing something that has allowed us to be taken on a journey. Yeah. Like, as though you're with the team. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you're, it's almost like you've with, with their research and their understanding of everything. It's like, okay, we now understand the importance of synchronicity. Now we've got our understanding importance of these connections. Now you well, now you thing, understood yeah. this. You've got to see how it all now. You've got to, now. yeah. I mean, it's it's weird. I agree with, with what you say, definitely. But I, but I also think, in a way, that these these connections lend themselves to the synchronicities because you know they look at you know Point Pleasant. They draw that line. It lands slap bang where you know Woody met you know mm. Injured Cold. You know, as we know, Injured Cold was mentioned in the Terry Wrist um, interview with Alan Greenfield, which, you know, which was kind of the main crux of the investigation, you know, back in season one, which is, which in itself, I think is, you know, is quite a significant um, synchronicity. So, yeah, although it was less about the fact that they were synchronicities, I think indirectly, they kind of lend themselves to that, you know, as well mm. as being connections, you know, within the, within the case. And that's where you just, start, I mean, it was another thread that he unraveled and it was one where he sort of just started, pulling at a few you know a few bits bits of the thread and then yeah. suddenly the whole thing is unraveling in front of him when he's the whole jumper has just gone to pieces yeah. now <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah and the thing is it's it's almost it's what i've noticed with this as well is that because these guys are paranormal investigators they're not really yeah. on board with the ufology and the cryptozoology and no, that has so been much. a huge no. part of that region for so many decades now that yeah. you know with, with the mothman sightings uh, you've got ufo activity you've got bigfoot activity various other different cryptids in and around that vicinity the same areas that, yeah yeah it's like i've started to realize is that the, the importance of this 37 parallel what is yeah. it there is an importance there we just don't know what it is you know it's exactly like, yeah it's um i think it was something that uh, that Amy said later on in one of the other episodes. Um, where is it? I know, but I don't know what I know. Does that make sense? Mm. You know, it's yeah. It does make sense. It does, yeah. Which is which is like weird. Double, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's double weird negative. because yeah. <laughs> yeah, like like you and I we was we was talking about um, like the cipher and stuff, mm. um, but. You feel like, okay, I, I can follow it. If someone else is explaining, I can follow where yeah. they're going with it. But Don't if me you to... asked me to yeah. explain it to you, yeah. I, my mind would just turn to... Just to melt. To, yeah. it just melt. I'd yeah. just, you know, to get a proper face melt going on, it would just be <laughs> brain fart and verbal diarrhoea yes, coming it, out. You're just like, says no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> proper meltdown. Just, it's just yeah. like, there's no, just don't even try and don't even get try me to me. explain yeah. it. It's it's a um, weird yeah it's, it's it's a weird a weird thing but um yeah it was quite a I know we've we've kind of done it in parts but I think I think that's quite a significant point to to kind of start off with in 
in this kind of summary of the you know the, the the sort of the latter half because you know as you say it's it's kind of less about sort of synchronicities although you know I sort of feel that indirectly they they are some of them are synchronicities in their own right but mm. yeah it's about connection and it's about kind of showing us as the viewer kind of why these locations are significant and why they've gone there and you know and, and essentially why these you know strange goings on have been happening you know and and mm. the fact that there, there is more to it than circumstance or you know you know coincidence or you know whatever it whatever it may be there is a kind of almost like a science to it and you know it's there's there's more more to it than what we you know maybe initially kind of realized so it was definitely yeah you know, i thought it was vital um it, it was kind of weird how it was thrown in so soon after the amy stuff it was almost like a it was kind yeah. of like right go away and digest that and in the meantime bam we're, <laughs> yeah. gonna, we're gonna hit you with this it's like yeah what, what? yeah it's like we just got hit by a right hook yeah and uh whilst you're whilst you're thinking about it that they, they the chin you with the uppercut yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and it was um, right now now try and stand up <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah are you with us yeah you with us yeah yeah, yeah you're still with us are you yeah yeah, because so, yeah, you know, I have watched through this this um, later part at least twice now. Yeah, um, it, like since I think, well, in total now I've watched the whole lot three times, but this wow. last part I watched it another time after that because I again it was like I wanted to make sure that I got everything in because there's there's so much there's so much that happens. There and is, there's so yeah. much information that we could do another four or five hours on this oh, if, if, we were, if we were to cover yeah. all of it. But yeah. well, we, we discussed this, didn't we? We don't want to do that because it would just take yeah. too much away from Helia. Yeah, um, we want to sort of send people in their direction to watch it and, you know, enjoy it for what it is. Because, you know, you yeah. may enjoy listening to us and our interpretations and you know almost our conclusions on it but it's best if you go away and watch it and come to your own yeah we yeah, want you guys to go and watch it as said. well you know yeah, go and exactly. go and check it out and like really see it for what it is yeah. as well um, I mean, even... which go on. yo well, sorry what i was going to say was that is pretty much what happened for a lot of people when helia went live mm. um that was something that they they discuss quite heavily was the amount of synchronicities synchronicities collective synchronicities that the audience had mm. with regards to all these different things and mailing in different information that the team had no idea about um and yeah. even stuff was was cropping up that so this was really kind of like the start of the recording of season two for them was when helia season one went live yeah and people coming in and saying, oh, yeah, you know, I live in Kentucky and I've seen these things and yeah. I've heard about these stories about the mine shafts and everything else. And even people yeah. saying, oh, I live in Somerset, Kentucky, and there's some weird stuff going on here. And this yeah. is after they've received the emails from Amy saying, I'm, I'm in, in Somerset. Somerset, Kentucky, yeah, and there's exactly. this mad cult of people where, it's, you know, they're trying to create things for the greater good and everything else. Yeah. And, you know, so it was almost like, and this was a, a concept that I think they kind of um, explore a little bit later on, was that Helia wasn't just for the team. It was for the greater audience, yeah. for the greater experience, that almost like it was set up to be this way, that so many people got involved with it and basically put so much energy into it as well. That, like we have, we've put loads of energy into this. You're like looking yeah. at these other bits, looking at those other bits, ordering various different books, finding very rare different books, like you did. Credit to you on that. Um, <laughs> you know, so it was, and what was quite interesting as well was the occultists that got involved with yeah. information. And they were saying they came, they, they emailed the team directly and was like, you do realize that you're doing initiation ritual yeah here. yeah it was you fans being, that brought them to it wasn't it that kind of brought it yeah. to their attention yeah that they've really brought in the esoteric occult yeah. side of things to them which yeah opened up a completely different point and Complete, again yeah it was another yeah it was another lead another thread for them to 
you know kind of you know unravel i mean you know we've i mean that that pretty much alone is you know kind of episode five and you know going back to you know you know kind of not doing a you know blow for blow we you know we've mm. kind of skimmed over the fact that you know following amy's email tyler and greg actually go to somerset kentucky and oh, go yeah, in, sorry you're right they do and they and they don't and they jump into one of the uh, caves that uh, they believe is kind of re um, remarked in, in one of her emails. And, you know, Tyler being Tyler wants to go in as deep as he, he bloody well can. That's right. Cause it was, and, it was what Dana said, wasn't it? She said, yeah. I told them both under no circumstances are they to go into any caves. And then it yeah, cuts Nick's to them seen, into a cave. They're in a cave <laughs> <laughs> about halfway down as far as yeah. they can go. And Tyler's just like, come on, let's keep going. And come you on, let's go. You can tell Greg's like, Greg's Greg's like, like sorry, uh... David, did you see a moose? You know, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that? You saw a moose? Sorry, what? Well, I, I can't should... hear you. We're in a cave. Yeah, we'll probably stay, should stay here. But no, they, they go in and Tyler thinks that he can hear, you know, voices and, and whispers further down into, you know, sort of the cave, which is a part that they can't access. But where they stand are piles of bones animal bones and animal bones, yeah. you know quite large animals so not not the sort that you would like you know rodent or you know i don't know no no it so looks it, like, like um like, well, like, moose, like a deer, deer or something like that yeah that kind of uh that kind of size so that that but yeah but that that's they they purely go there because of the intrigue of amy's emails uh and the fact mm. that they came in the night before tyler was due to go to um that area anyway so um yeah yeah so that, that that bit we we've we, we sort of missed out but, but kind of deliberately because nothing ultimately happened other than the fact they went to a cave yeah know, following other than cars, because tyler other than you got excited. tyler yeah tyler gets really excited <laughs> marches on in there and there's greg uh, like kind of holding back like, oh, well, maybe well, we should we should go we should go it's, yeah it did i do like tyler because he is so enthusiastic. He's just like, oh, my God, there's a skull. And, like, he's over there, he's poking the skull, and Greg's like... Oh, no, no, no. Well, he's it's holding it weird. up like Hamlet, like, looking into his eyes. And <laughs> like, like, oh, I want to wanna it, see... I yeah. want to see where these whispers are coming from. I want to get deeper into it. And Yeah, exactly. Like, I want to squeeze through this tight... Hole. Basically, yeah. been caving, but, yeah, Greg was just... With no equipment for it. And he probably knew he was going to get a bollocking from the missus once she'd seen the footage. And uh, that would have been that would have been funny being a fly on the wall there. Yeah, I'd love to have seen that filmed. The look on her face. Yeah, <laughs> the scathing interrogation. Don't piss, don't piss off a hedge witch. I'd Tell say you yeah, that now. Get on the wrong side of a witch. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much the uh, you know episode five, which is essentially the first episode that we're covering in that. I know everyone's probably yeah. sitting there, the same you know reacting the same as that we did, just like what. <laughs> Yeah. Talking about the occult and you know caves and all these like gods that are worshipped and but but that's really just the kind of you know tip of the iceberg you know with it all um, you know really because mm. what I quite liked is the next episode kind of scoots back you know kind of a little bit well not not so much in the timeline but in terms of the actual year but it's about I think it's about three days prior to season one of Helia um, actually launching uh the yeah. the premiere as uh, as they call it um and the team actually find themselves back in you know back in helia and back in the cave where they found the infamous tin can yeah they do yeah. and uh, i think it was actually rashad sizemore um the cameraman who actually points out before they go there he was like does anyone know why we didn't actually pick the tin can up and yeah. bring it away, and yeah, that's, that's it because he was sitting there, sitting with, there. He, he was, was sitting there with Connor. Yeah, he was just like, why did no why one we pick, to up? pick up the tin yeah. can? They all just look blankly at each other and like, oh yeah. And so basically, oh, yeah. they decide to head back down there to see if they can, uh, you know, see if they can actually find it because they realised that there wasn't actually any reason why, you know, they didn't. I think Dana comments on the fact that you know, obviously, being more paranormal investigators, there's a lot of kind of artifacts and things that they find that they yeah. have to be careful you know not to remove because obviously that you know a, a spirit can attach itself or a, a negative energy can attach itself so absolutely they yeah. reckon that they they she thinks that that subconsciously may have played a part as to why she didn't personally uh you know kind of pick it up but as a group they didn't really have anything as to why they didn't uh you know sort of pick it up with them so yeah well, they, they headed yeah back, maybe uh, maybe that was 
the reason, really, because maybe that was potentially because yeah. they never it discuss seems it, like so no, they don't discuss it. But what it seems like when they did do when they did do that little uh, I guess a ritual investigation in that train tunnel that at the end of it they just felt like this ease of like yes yeah, it's done like do you remember yeah. that at the end of it at end of season one they were like yeah, yeah. we're done here now we're and done, like this is it. having yeah. that yep yeah, everything's done you wander off like it's yeah. like at the end of the day you, you down your tools and you walk out the door it's yeah that's kind that, of what they did that sort of thing so, maybe that's yeah. what it was was okay we're done we no longer need to be here yeah and but I did like that the fact that Greg Dana and Tyler decided to go back and they did like a little live stream, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, and that's they where did. they did yeah. go back and they did find that tin can. They did. They, they, I mean, it moved quite significantly from where they remembered like kicking it and stuff. It had actually gone to like sort of the other side of the, the, the railway uh, wall. There was like a lot of um, mm. big sleepers, which I think were essentially holding up the, uh, pillars, well, weren't they? But yeah, but yeah, pillars, yeah. And um, yeah, it basically wedged it, found itself wedged between one of these pillars and uh, and the rock. But so yeah, they they found it. I think we commented on it in the last episode that, that, that to us, I think we did at least, um, that to us it looked more like a, a camping decanter that you would sort of get on the top yeah. of a thermos or whatever to you know to drink from. It looked more like that, like a canister. Yeah, yeah, more like a like a little teacup. Rather yeah, than a metal teacup sort of thing, yeah, as opposed to an yeah, rather than a tin, tin can, can sort of thing, like a can of beans. It's kind of like that's when they I first mention it, yeah. that's what comes to our mind, sort of thing. I don't yeah. know if it's, I don't know if it'd be any different over like stateside. I don't know if it's an um, American thing or whatever. It's like a lost in translation type thing. But that's what I was expecting. But obviously, when they found it and they all, you know, they all confirmed mm. individually that that was what that was the can that they. You know that they saw. Uh, I think Connor was was the one that, that, that sort of confirmed it because I think it was him that initially saw it, wasn't it? In his in mm. his uh, in his vision. Um, so, but yeah, I thought it was interesting that they that they did that. But the other thing that I liked is when they were back there, um, whilst editing mm. the footage for season one, Carl was able to actually piece together um, a lot of Greg's footage where they thought their camera had run out of battery, but they did it. They did in fact film the property that they believed to be the house. That David Christie looked in um, back in season one That's with right. the whole goblins encounter, and so using you know sort of Google Maps and whatever else, Cole was actually able to pinpoint the exact location of that house. Now, you know whether it belonged to to David Christie, you know we we don't know. We know it belonged to a David we, M. Parsons, but whether that was David yes. M. Christie, we we yet to be confirmed. But that house, nonetheless, not only fit the uh, well, it fit the descriptions of his own email in terms of having like the front porch, the shed, child's uh, toys strewn across the lawn. So it hit all the kind of the criteria. But they they did a drive by um, once they'd sort of left the cave, and uh, and actually um, found that it had been burnt down, burnt to the ground, burnt to the ground. Now you know, yeah. look into that what you will, but you know, could that have been? you know, deliberate because of the heat of the, you know, the emails and they knew that a team was there filming a documentary and did it get back to yeah. the wrong people and well, I, military cover-up sort of kicks in and... Oh, well, yeah. I mean, being in close vicinity to South End and South End Seafront, um, whenever there is a building on fire, there seems to be nefarious alternative motives to yeah. it. Um, usually property development. Um, yeah. So it's a case of burning out an old building Inside so you don't job. have to demolish it. You yeah. get insurance money for it so you can then develop on that land and, yeah. and everything else. So I always, whenever I see that something's been burnt down, yeah, that's what comes to mind, that there's more yeah. nefarious things that are, that are to, to cause the fire. It's yeah, not exactly. just like... Um, like an electrical spark has, has caught light to the curtains and then yeah. it's just gone up, you know. Or like vandalism like, or arson or something. There's something yeah. more to it, yeah. There's some, yeah, even though there's an arson yeah. involved, quite likely arson's involved, yeah. it's for a reason outside of mindless violence or mindless destruction. You yeah. know, there's there's got to be a reason for it. Um, for that house in particular 
to have just gone up in flames and been burnt down to the ground. Um, but yeah, so I thought it was quite good that they they did go back there and they picked up the tin can and whilst they were there, they decided to to do another restless method, which is it kind of seems to be a bit of their MO, doesn't it? Really. They go there, it's they go to a location. Card. Yeah. They 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 put on the Estes method, they do a little session, a little experiment, yeah. which yielded some interesting results. Um I did, yeah. Now, this was just the three of them. So it's just Dana, Greg, and Tyler. And Dana decides to to perform the Estes method. Um, and Greg and Tyler ask subsequent questions, various different questions. And um they come to the conclusion basically again i don't want to go through a play-by-play with this go and watch it but the conclusion that they come to is that they need to play three different tones and that's it in order to gain access to uh, an opening or a gateway or even a line of communication well it's part of their language wasn't it i guess just for a bit of context dana was uh yeah was the, the sort of the vessel that the, the responses were being received through. And whenever Greg and Tyler are asking questions, a lot of the responses were in a three tone um, sort of key. Bing, bing, bing. Like, bing, bing, bing. And it, was, and it was that kind of repeated. And she was also told mm. to play the tones. And there was a few other responses that were given. And it takes three and, and stuff like this. It takes three, and... play the tones, and then the tones mm. were played. And this was in response to questions that were unrelated to this sort of music so like before it was um was it color and emotion was the way that they communicated Mm. this this particular entity or individual whoever it was they were talking to seemed to offer up responses by way of these that's interesting that's interesting that you that you took that sort of approach with it as well that you saw that the the tones were a way of communication i i didn't necessarily get that yeah, because no, they were unrelated. Got... If they were talking about music or, I don't know, if they were, I don't know if it was just like feedback or something that they could kind of associate with something, then I mm. may have just discounted it. But the fact that they were asking sort of relatively sort of unrelated questions, but the responses were coming back to those tones it was... in that order and that they had to be played at a certain like mm. tempo and, and which was confirmed in the you know in the in the estes method i i my takeaway was that that was that was a way of them kind of communicating something without directly using like our language or another okay. another form of cipher what they were trying to communicate yeah see what i took from that was that they were being given instructions as to how to initiate something um whether whether that's initiating another form of, of communication or um it's it's, it's opening something it's, it's an opening of something like, yeah. like because what it was was that there have been um when you it's kind of like an old archetype sort of thing that uh, you like the hero goes into the cave he has to say something or he has to play yeah. a certain tune or or whatever he has to do like a ding dong dong like El- elvish of, for f- Elvish for friend. <laughs> That's the one, yeah. Speak friend. You know, was, <laughs> yeah. And, and then the rock opens. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, it's even like, um, like even Batman. Batman has the little piano where he plays the three keys and then he goes, yeah. like that, and he sits <laughs> in it and he goes, straight into the back cave. And, you <laughs> yeah. know, so yeah. that's kind of what I took from it, that, that Dana was receiving yeah. instructions mm. for later on that... Because that's kind of like the, the the conclusion that she comes to that they have to play these three tones yeah. together to create At that an tempo. overall sound. Yeah, to create well, something. Yeah. Well, no, I because I, she says it it takes three. So one of them's got to do the bing, the other one's got to do the bing, and then the other yeah. one's got to do the bing or whatever yeah. that they but they go whatever the sequence was. Yeah. Like that, but they they yeah, keep what... that. Greg they harmonise. Yeah, that they were played as one. And it makes sense if you understand the what sound waves can do. So yeah. it's it's something that cropped up in a question that came from one of our listeners about the importance of sound waves and 
and things like this. Um, yeah. I mean, we discussed this question and we did, yeah. We figured we could probably do an entire fucking episode on it. <laughs> so... it's, probably, it's probably worthwhile <laughs> because answering it, answering it would be uh, episode length. Yeah, on yeah. Anyway, so we can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to to James, James but we can't yeah. just chuck that one in now straight no. off because it it could be a feature length answer. No. Well, and funny enough, it does. Yeah. Just to touch on that quickly, that that question did kind of sync up with a subject matter that we had previously discussed doing an episode on. Yeah, but wasn't necessarily sure whether we were going to do it or not. And then obviously with how this three-parter has gone and then obviously James's question it's kind of given it enough weight that we've now decided that yeah it's actually it's actually you know, we're actually going to do uh, an episode on it but yeah but yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come on to that but okay. yeah so um yeah. what I've kind of my takeaway from that Estes method um along with things like vibration and like so, so she kept saying the word vibration telephone she even said don't trust Doug as well which I thought was quite interesting yeah. um but my takeaway from it was um, using sound as a technology again. And I think yeah. I, I've mentioned this on, on other episodes. And it, it, I remember, I can't remember which bloody podcast it was that I listened to, but this guy was telling a story about being a, an explorer. I think it might have been a, a, a Joe Rogan podcast, but he's saying that he was able to explore caves and find sacred spaces. So being able to find um, artifacts or paintings or carvings in the dark, just by listening. So he would go through the, the cave, making a noise like a boom, like that. And then yeah. he would be able to feel how the sound resonates. And the moment that he could feel something resonate, so he could feel it throughout his entire body, he would then put the light on and he would said with quite a high frequency he would often find an artifact or a painting or a carving in that part where he just decided to to stop because the yeah. sound had resonated within him um that's right and it was there is got there's something about sound as well because it's worthwhile checking out um tibetan monks levitating boulders using sound the stories that come out of Tibet in the 1930s. Those are quite interesting for anyone that wants to have a, a little listen to that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so we'll I digress a little bit there. Yeah. The the other as thing per. that happens <laughs> as per uh, I know I've got a, I have a strong tendency for these sort of things. Um, the one thing that the other thing that comes up is um, the idea of liminality. So this yes. idea of an in between sort of thing so an in between a space or in between a time or or presence or um an energy or a state and yeah that comes it seems... early in the episode doesn't it because yeah it talks about liminality marginality and anti-structure, anti-structure. yeah yeah which like is exactly what it sounds that, like it's yeah. anti-structure is the opposite of structure is it's, it's yeah. chaos mm. um and it it kind of makes sense that these things matter so if you think about it all the films and everything else and all the paranormal investigations like uh, real world investigations not just films and tv but they often feature like in particular poltergeist activity often circulates around someone going through puberty or someone going through a very tough point in their life so this this point in someone's life where nothing's settled and it's yeah. a transition from one from that, one that point to another point, mid the midlife not midlife crisis but that that midlife point and because so, yeah they link that to things like the conjuring uh haunting the the exorcist and a number of others yes. they all and various other possessions all seem to involve as you say young girls before mm. they hit sort of puberty and it's that well, physical transition that it seems to open them up or make them more susceptible to yeah yeah to certain phenomena. the one that always comes to my mind is uh what, like what you said the conjuring uh the conjuring 2 in particular which is about the enfield haunting yeah. in the 80s and which did involve a young family and in particular a a young girl that was going through puberty mm. and she was seemingly possessed by 
this spirit of this old man. Um, and it seems like that is quite a strong feature with regards to paranormal activity, that there is this liminality, there is this thing of in-between state that yes, that's right. really pushes forward. And Connor makes a, a good point as well. That it's not just um, about people, it's about locations as well. So you think about it, anywhere that's never settled, would be like hotels, prisons, asylums, train stations, hospitals, things like that, where it's, oh, people are always shifting through, yeah. moving through. There's, there's always, there's that liminality, there's that in-between of one state to another or mm. one place to another. And yeah. it, it makes a lot of sense that the people that would be marginalised mm. or on the fringes, on the outside yeah. of, of the, the, the bubble, the protection of society... Yeah, that's right, yeah. ..would experience these things. But yeah, don't know about you, but if that is the case, it kind of sounds predatory, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it looks like whoever or whatever it is is yeah is 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 seeking out specific prey you know you could argue is it you know easy prey or or more vulnerable mm. sort of prey someone who's more likely to you know be sort of open or or accessible you know to to that kind of thing which is why there are people that are more uh, that are easier to hypnotize than others because of maybe the point they're at you know their their mindset and that kind of thing so yeah it does definitely does sound um sort of predatory um you know definitely um funnily enough i just <laughs> although we spoke about it quite a bit i've just found my, my notes on the Go essence on. method <laughs> that we've actually spoke quite a bit about but that's mostly your fault but because my notes and i'll I'll read what i put oh god yeah yeah I, put, I, I didn't write too much but i, I put dana does a, another double blind spirit box i.e estes method yeah full stop Mostly nonsense. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly nonsense. Because it, that's, that's, that was the. Mate, I love the way you do this because you that, you do this. You you would take like a a good fifteen minute chunk and just go just nonsense. That just nonsense. <laughs> but we, which for the no most bollocks. part it, it kind of you know was and you know people will hopefully go through and you know kind of watch it you know make up their own mind but they it was kind of a speculative attempt to, you know, at trying the Estes method, you know, Connor wasn't there, you know, it was just the three of them and it was, it's kind of mm. his baby, but you know, they, they try and do it. And Greg and Tyler were kind of asking the questions and, you know, they were getting responses. And for, and for the most part, the, the responses didn't match up to what they were asking. There were a few points where comments were made and then Dana would say something and then they'd be like, yeah. <gasps> Oh my god! Like you know, and, and try and sort of try and insinuate that that, that you know that, that it was connecting up in in some way. But even with like the the tones and stuff, you know, I I I didn't I didn't read too much into it at the time. But I just saw it as another way of, like I said, another way of of whatever it was, sort of communicating because maybe the signal wasn't as strong because maybe you know because Connor wasn't there, and like I say, it's kind of his baby. And yeah, I think I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure that either all of them or or one of the team weren't overly convinced in trying it, or they weren't overly comfortable in trying it. And I think that was kind of, I think that was kind of reflected when they did it because nothing really synced up from, like I say, the questions asked, you know, to the responses that that you know that Dana was receiving. Um, and, I, that, and that was kind of the takeaway. Yeah, um, I think you're from, right there. But I, I think you are right there. Yeah, I mean, it was just funny that we spoke quite a lot about it, and that's why I was looking through. My notes. Like, it's nonsense. That part <laughs> I just said mostly nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yet, we, yet we've offered on for about a quarter of an hour about it. But yeah, so, I know, right? Yeah. But, but no, just see, the thing is, that I do take. I I I see a lot more re relevance relevance even yeah <laughs> a bit uh, tell me about it a bit more relevance in those sort of things than you do i think because yeah. uh, obviously i do have my experience with meditation and and yes. and all those sort of things and and, and yeah. getting into those sort of states that it, it, it's yeah, that's fair. you can well, especially when dana starts talking about these things and the language that she uses it does resonate with because the way that she explains how she's feeling in those moments, I can go, yep, I know exactly what she's talking about. You know more, yeah. Because 
I know, but I don't know what I know, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah, that exactly. sort of thing, you know? If, again, yeah. Exactly. Well, it's... like we discussed before we recorded uh, yesterday, I think it was, um, you know, you've got more of a handle and more of an experience on the kind of the magic side and the, the sort of the meditation side. And Yeah, I've always found this, that really interesting. It's kind of the spiritual side of it, whereas I'm still a relative you know amateur or, or newbie to all that sort of thing so i'm mm. still kind of you know learning or tr you know trying to get my head around a lot of it so you know for me a lot of that was just kind of a bit throwaway really which is why I've, which is why i put the comments that i did because i didn't <laughs> mostly in the, in nonsense the, well in the grander <laughs> scheme of things and you know kind of where the case was going i didn't feel that that really added much to what they were doing or you know to what they were trying to i just think that yeah. you know, they were there they had the opportunity and so it was just a speculative you know investigation in the hope that it might throw something up that that was but what it does do though it does add credence to what they do later on in, like, yeah, in, in the episodes in doesn't it because it, it adds something to what they then did you know kind of later yeah. on although I, although again i didn't really feel that they got much from that but we can also come on to that when we we'll discuss that we, uh, <laughs> come to that point in the uh in this we'll cross that's, that bridge later yeah, that's the, uh, at the, the, the arse end of it but um but no, the, the, the thing that i thought was was kind of more compelling was the stuff that happened before that and i can i can run through that yeah but, go for it but this is basically on the premiere day of um season one of of hellier um so three days after they go back to Helia to look for the, the tin can or whatever that we discussed earlier. And they start getting these emails from, from fans and from people that have watched the, you know, the documentary or, and, and whatnot. And they, they, they start getting these emails to say, and what one in particular comes in from a guy called uh, John, who basically gives his interpretation of the cipher. And he, he basically determines that certain words in the interview um from greenfield basically provide the location of where terry wrist and injured cold had their their meeting um and he uses the word ash uh from the yeah. interview and then someone else uh tweets greg i think or, or connor with their own theory um and they name a place called ashland ohio so that you've got the first guy emailing saying that the word ash is quite significant they get another tweet mentioning ashland which is a place in ohio and i think they're in C cincinnati ohio so again there's that's that right yeah kind of connection which it seems like they that they went north into yeah. they, they just went in the wrong direction looking for ashland yeah basically that's what yeah. it seems to be doesn't it because um, they obviously you've got ashland or ohio but then there's the ashland kentucky which is where they went and which is where they, they ended subsequently up going believe that they yeah. found the location as to where Indrid Cole met yeah because they wrist that, yeah because that they obviously in this same tweet they come up with uh, the name of uh, that, that restaurant the wagon wheel um mm. and yeah and then uh, uh, an author actually reaches out um a guy by the name of Andy Colvin um and he essentially claims that he's actually found Indrid Cole's house using a spirit box and um, right. yeah and then th th so that that kind of corroborates a lot of what they kind of already thought and adds a lot of weight to other information that they'd found themselves in their own research in that kind mm. of off season between releasing season one and filming season two so a lot of that kind of tied in and and added uh yeah sort of synchronicity to um yeah, to stuff that they'd already found themselves, which, mm. yeah, which I thought was, um, yeah, was quite interesting. That 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 comes before the uh, Estes method in the in the cave with like the the, the tones and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then it's about three months after um, they receive another email from I think it's I think he goes by the name of Vaughan. I think that's right. It's Vaughan. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he claims to actually know Terry Wrist. And this is where he starts to go into a little bit more about him as an individual by saying that Wrist is uh, a name synonymous with Tennessee in yeah. the, the States. So it's actually it's pronounced Wrist instead Reist. of Wrist. Yeah. So it's more of an E, you know, kind of sound in the pronunciation. 
Um, he claims that they met in the late 70s. Uh, he confirms that... Uh, and he basically confirms that he spoke to a v Vietnam war vet called Terry, um, who was a, a tunnel rat. Yeah. Um, and this matches basically information that the team had found earlier but hadn't released. Mm. So again, this is another email that's coming from really, Brandon. really piqued their interest because, yeah. again, Pinpointed. more information that's coming in that hasn't yeah. been released. No, exactly. Um, so He yeah, was but, quite exact with his, with his information as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was quite exact. Yeah, so like with the, the tunnel rat thing, and he explained what tunnel rats did. He explained that he was a Vietnam War vet, which they already kind of knew. The time frame of when they met kind of fell into place for the timeline of the Vietnam War. Also, the age of uh, that Terry Wrist would have been, uh, you know, at that time. Um, they, yeah, they, yeah. So they they get that that email, um, and. Yeah, they basically just confirm. They, I think, they confirm with someone else how Terry Wrist's surname, you know, should actually have been pronounced. Like I say, it's Terry mm. Wrist as opposed to Wrist, um, which kind of takes it away from the terrorist kind of yeah pseudonym sort of you know pen name or whatever. They could actually um, be his real name. You know, yeah, it, exactly. Could actually be a name as opposed to just yeah an, an alias mm. that they were initially led to. Uh, you know to to believe um the the bit that i kind of found quite amusing was that the, the team started to get sucked into this story and, and others because this guy this vaughn claims that terry and other vets told them about basically seeing man-sized spiders and goblins um in these tunnels mm. whilst hunting Viet Cong. Um, yeah out in in sort of vietnam and that's what i thought was quiet because i listened i thought Okay, I was with them initially, but now this is getting a little too convenient. Um, obviously, we know, yeah, you know, there aren't necessarily such things as conveniences or coincidences, but I just thought this is kind oh, of know. this is kind of hitting the nail a little too on the head, you know, with this. And so I, I was kind of like, well, okay, and then they're talking about man sized spiders and these goblins, you know, whilst going in tunnels looking for Viet Cong yeah. and. You know, just, you know, any kind of war enthusiast, you know, would know from various films that have been released, which I know have been Hollywood, you know, bastardized by Hollywood or dramatized mm, oh, definitely. You know, by Clint Eastwood and whatever. But, you know, th there's a lot of depictions of, you know, uh, and stories of soldiers going into these tunnels, you know, getting lost, you know, finding Viet Cong, you know, sort of killed themselves or whatever. And not once was there any kind of relation to kind of seeing anything strange, any weird noises, any kind of odd goings on or whatever. So I just think it seems like yeah. an isolated case for me to kind of add any, you know, kind of credence. Well, but, but then if there are government cover-ups, then, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. But there was also, there is quite a lot of this, I suppose, of, a plethora might not be the, the right sort of term, but <laughs> yeah. there's, there is quite a number of stories that came out of the vietnam war yeah. um, especially from tunnel rats yeah, yeah. where they did come into contact with various different creatures um so the the fact that right, okay. the man side spiders came up and um goblin like creatures came up wasn't a huge surprise to me because i yeah. have looked into even out just out of um interest and entertainment really that yeah, course, the strange yeah. stories that these tunnels weren't actually created by the Viet Cong they were created by other things and yeah, yeah. the Cong the Viet Cong just used them. There's other stories yeah. of reptilian like beings um okay. where um the where the tunnel rats have gone through these tunnels and they've like leaned against the wall there and it's collapsed through into a bigger tunnel a cavern or that, a nest or something well almost kind of like that there's one that that crops that comes to my mind was that it was like the the walls of this larger tunnel that was running adjacent to yeah. or running parallel sorry running parallel with this this tunnel the, the Viet Cong tunnel where he coll collapsed into the wall fell into this bigger tunnel it was like the the walls of the tunnel were polished 
And as he continued down this little bit, he could hear noises. He basically, cut a long story short, he comes into contact with these strange humanoid reptilian beings, right. um, which he fires upon. And these beings, they scarp up and he gets the hell out of there. Yeah. yeah. Um, because that's basically what they were trying to do. And it, this says so in, in the documentary that they were trying yeah, to go down there with their, do yeah. with their 1911s and the hand grenade. Yeah. And you go down there, fire out, a few yeah. shots, chuck it in there and, and off you pop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, there, there are a lot okay. of strange, strange stories that came out of the Vietnamese War, especially surrounding the tunnels. Um, that back then, yeah, the sort of yeah, it's, it's un- worthwhile checking it out, mate. It yeah, really maybe. is. Well, maybe we've they're... got a future episode, perhaps. <laughs> I think so, mate. I really do <laughs> because, again, it's I think that the world of the paranormal and the high strangers, mate, it's yeah. it's so vast. It's definitely yeah. There's so much that we can do. It oh, really mate, is. Yeah, it's it's the, the possibilities are. Uh, are endless aren't they mm. yeah. but what i'd like um, about sorry go on mate i was just gonna say hold on a second uh... so yes yeah, so that that's kind of where this fawn kind of comes in with you know with his email um which again a lot of the details sort of tie up with information that the team had found out about terry wrist or terry reist if you, if you believe mm. that. Um, and he actually goes into describing Terry himself and explains the conversation, which we've kind of paraphrased mm. quite significantly. Um, you know, but there's basically just a lot about, you know, his, his job as a, a, a tunnel rat in the Vietnam War and, and whatnot. Um, and obviously receiving this email and having it tie up with a lot of what the team kind of had found out themselves and what they believed they knew, you know, from the initial interview. They then mm. finally decide to um, go and speak with uh, Alan Greenfield himself, who's the uh, author of the um, uh, Secret Cipher of, of the Youth of the Youthonauts. Indeed, yes. I know we've yeah. both uh, sort of purchased. Um, and it's quite a tr- I, th- I don't think it's too much of a trip from him. But basically, Connor and Greg head to Atlanta, Georgia, where Alan is based, um, and that essentially kicks off episode seven where they arrive in atlanta uh and basically record an interview um with him um Mm. now i've not finished the whole book i've probably got about halfway through um but the first half is basically alan greenfield basically claiming like basically saying how great he is by saying that (laughs) he's figured out the cipher when all of these great people before him had the cipher, but didn't know they had the cipher, but, but his greatness managed to kind of bring it to the forefront. And he basically just poo poos over, a, a, you know, a lot of people. That's exactly, that's exactly what I got. From it that well. kind of had it before. And he, yeah. I mean, he mentions like, you know, Woody he speaks quite highly of, you know, of Woody Derenberger and, and, you know, he, he speaks of like Alistair Crowley, of course. And, you know, mm-hmm. and then sort of a few, you know, a few others, a few other sort of occultists and whatnot. But essentially, the first half is is basically that. I'm I'm probably about, I'm probably a couple of chapters into what I'd say is like the second half of the book, where he actually starts to break down the cipher and how you can use it against certain mm-hmm. words and and where you know you need to notice the patterns and and that kind of thing. Which kind of comes back to what we were both saying earlier about you know we're starting to kind of understand the cipher and how people are getting the results. But I yeah. couldn't. I, I couldn't confidently sit here and explain it to someone. I so couldn't even of, explain it to you, to be no, honest. No, we couldn't yeah. explain it to each other. <laughs> on the same so, wavelength. So. Yeah. It's like I, I, I understand it, but I don't understand it. Sort of yeah. Thing. <laughs> I yeah, know, that's but I don't exactly it. Sort of thing. Yeah. But, uh, but no, so it, like I say, it, the interview um, kicks off basically by them being told um, that they're being guided by the Third Order. Mm. who I know listeners will hopefully know we've mentioned before in episode two because it was the third order who is basically in control supposedly of um, euthanauts and injured cold and Mm. and others who have come to the planet you know like the masons or the you know the illuminati they're they're a believed kind of secret society who act act on a a higher ground and they're higher beings than us uh, you know mere mortals 
so the, the, the basically interview kicks off, you know, sort of with that. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he reiterates that they're essentially being guided uh, by, by the Third Order and they're following certain steps or, you know, following a ritual um, that I know the team have been told about, you know, already as, as we've already discussed. Mm. And Greenfield basically runs through kind of his own cipher uh which is in you know which is which is in the book which is taken from like alistair crowley and and other sort of occultists through through history um and yeah he basically starts off with the word helia and he runs that through uh the cipher which is basically assigning letters of the alphabet with a number but it's every 11 so you start with a as the number one and then you count 11, and then that letter would be number two, and then another 11, three, and so on and so on, until basically every number of the alphabet has been assigned a number. And yeah. then that's how you then kind of work through sort of the cipher. That, that's pretty much a idiot's guide to what I've learned so that's far. That's pretty much it, yeah. About <laughs> the cipher. Um, and so basically running the word Helia through the cipher, he comes up with the number 93, which is believed to be sacred. Um, particularly those who follow, as we've said, Alistair Crowley. Yeah, so all um, the Thelemites. Yes, which, and that they come up, yeah, quite significantly through mm. pretty much every episode for the remainder of the season, really. Um, so, yeah, the, like I say, the team believe that they are conducting a ritual and they ask Alan whether he believes that this is the case. He basically agrees. Um, and... They they basically straight up ask Alan, you know, whether whether he believes Terry Wrist is real, uh, like an actual person, um, and he he says yes because obviously they conducted the or he supposedly conducted the interview, you know, yep. back in the day, and they also ask him, which is I'm sure a question that a lot of people I think have even you in their mind. you brought I, this up as well I think I brought it up in the last episode actually our last episode. Um, and they actually ask it, uh, Alan Greenfield, are you Terry Wrist? Nonsense um, is his response, isn't it? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Thought that was quite funny, considering. Yeah. Considering, yeah. <laughs> considering that would have been my just response, but uh, absolute yeah. nonsense. He was like, nonsense. <laughs> no, he's like, it's, it's not me. And I was just like, mm, okay, alrighty then. All right. Um, yeah, he also suggests that he can contact terry again but it's been 20 something years since he yeah. kind of last attempted so he wouldn't really feel comfortable a bit like um tonya derenberger she she was kind of the only vessel that could contact injured cold or his sons alan was you know pretty much unless they went down the whole vaughan route again alan greenfield was sort of suggesting that he was the only person that could actively um contact mm. uh, you know, well, he said as well Terry. that he could f um, confirm Terry Reese's uh, existence yeah. through other members of the group they were part of collectively. Yeah. But he said, like, you, it, it's kind of like this whole thing of, like, that I doubt they'd want to talk to you because they're high-level political types and yeah, I doubt you actually get a conversation with them, but they would be the people. You know what, the, just to and I of... thought... <laughs> Just to kind of add some kind of real world context, the yeah. the interview with Alan Greenfield reminded me of those people on Facebook, you know, those attention seekers who who put statuses like, oh, my God, I can't believe that just happened. And then they get a barrage of comments from people saying, oh, my God, what happened? And then, they get, me, a, and then they get, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Or, or DM me, babe, or some, some bullshit like that. And you just think, yeah. that's what this was. It was like... It was like he he put the info out there, and then as soon as people started asking him questions, it was like, oh was no, like, well, I, no, can't, no, talk I can't, about, can't talk about I can't talk about that. I can't tell you that. And it's just like, oh, did you know what he did? God, he did he did a Tom DeLong on on the Joe Rogan podcast. That's exactly what he did. Because I've, I've, I've still not seen that. No, mate, you've got to see it because uh, you're a Blink fan as well, wouldn't you? So. I am. That's and I think that's kind of why I, I don't want to watch it because it's I know so funny throughout the entire episode. Throughout like the entire podcast, Tom DeLong's like, going, "Yeah, we got this, we got that, we we got this footage, that footage." And Joe Rogan's like, "Well, show me, show me then." And yeah. he's like, 
I can't do I that. I'll show you. Yeah, exactly. I can't, yeah. I can't show you yet. And he's like, and he, uh, Joe Rogan, buddy, ends like, why are you here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, and I really like you know Blink, and I think I don't want to watch it for that reason because I know I'm pretty sure the NAC guys, um, again, they say our bros in not another conspiracy podcast. They did uh, obviously an episode on this as well, and they. And I think they also mentioned that Tom DeLong interview and, and a lot of them kind of got quite passionate about kind of defending Tom, you know, DeLong. But I still <laughs> yeah. kind of look at it and think that was kind of probably a way of him just going on something like Joe Rogan, promoting the, um, the, to, the, stars. the, the to the stars program and the fact mm-hmm. that you could buy shares and stuff and kind of dangling that carrot, but not wanting to give you the full info. And I kind of got the impression mm-hmm. that Alan Greenfield you know, kind of does this because he he doesn't give a lot away. Although they ask him no. a lot of questions, and it's a lot of the questions that I'm sure you and I and other watchers of the documentary would have had on the tip of our tongues. And Connor and Greg were great in asking them and being quite forward and, and quite blunt with yeah. with asking them. But Alan doesn't give a lot away, and he guesses on a lot of stuff. So Connor or Greg would say, "Oh, you know, we we found this out, and we believe it's got links to this." You know, what do you think? Oh yeah, no, I, I, I think you know, you, you know, you, yeah, you, you could be right, or you know, you could be going down the right path, or you know, run it through the cipher. What does the yeah. cipher tell you? Oh, it's it's number ninety three or it's number ninety one. Well, that's significant, isn't it? So that tells you all you need to know. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, no, it fucking doesn't. no, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, it, doesn't. it doesn't tell it doesn't us tell anything any, we need to it know. Tells you supposedly you know what, what you know, but you know what I want to. Uh, harken back to what Vaughn said about Terry Wrist yeah. is that in these conversations with him, which he, which is weird because he doesn't really give a, te- a sense of time scale with that, like how no. long he was interacting with Terry. Yeah, for. yeah. Um, but he he said that his impression of Terry was that he was trying to figure out what you knew without giving you any more information. He, yeah, he was he was he was almost interviewing them. That's what they, I got from Greenfield. Thought- yeah, but they thought they were so. Connor and Greg thought they were in, interviewing Greenfield, but in fact, Greenfield yeah. was interviewing them by finding out how serious they were, how much they knew, or how much they thought they knew before he was willing to offer up any real info. Because there was a couple of yeah. times when he they asked him questions, and he said, "Oh, I'll tell you, but I'm not telling you on camera." Yeah. Oh, well, that's tell you off the record, sort that, of thing. That's convenient. Yeah. Yeah. And, it was, I don't know, it's just like, so he, like he conducted the initial interview with Terry Wrist, but conveniently he completely forgot the town where Terry met Indrid Cold. So he couldn't even confirm whether it was Ashland, Ohio. That's what, that's what got Kentucky. me a little and I just bit thought, suspicious of it. Come on, how can you not remember? Like, this is the thing that launched your, or helped launch your book. And, 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 yeah, and kind I of guess dragged, so. and it got dragged up again by the guys of Hellier doing their investigation and this is the one thing you know that you can't remember but he does kind of describe that it was somewhere near point pleasant south of the ohio river and it's just like mm. come on man like you're telling me you that's very remember. vague it really yeah, is that like, and then, yeah Christ. that did get the couple that with his um lack of answers or lack of offering up information for the team yeah. that is what got me a bit suspicious but then yeah. I think when you think about it, if that's the sort of person that he is and those are the sort of groups that he circles around, then it makes sense that that's what he's like anyway. So it's a convenient kind of they kind of they kind of dust over the fact that he is also a magician as well. That he he says that he's not a felomite, but he could very well be a felomite, but just does not want to give the information up because I don't think being a I don't think bearing in mind what I have learned about Alistair Crowley. Yeah. Being a fellow might isn't one of those things that you want to offer up because no, you you'd be almost frowned upon, wouldn't it? And well, yeah, kind of I, looked down on almost. Well, do you have to commit some debaucherous acts in well, order yeah, you have to, to be a bit of a dirty bastard to kind of yeah, get so, badge of honor? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, various <laughs> different badges as well, like yeah, like the old politely. boy scouts and, and yeah, all that exactly, sort of stuff. Yeah. But, but it was interesting that after all of this kind of vagueness and you know not really offering up much info, that this is when they actually ask him. And I almost kind of applauded the two of them when this happened because this is at this point 
that they actually think that Greenfield is Terry Wrist. He confirms that he isn't. He kind of laughs it off and says, oh, no, nonsense, and gives some reasons to why he can't be. And they believe yeah. him. I don't know if they just believed him out of respect because they didn't want the interview to get awkward or whether they were genuinely sucked in by kind of what he said. But I don't think either of them sort of came away feeling that that was, you know, particularly helpful, other than the fact the secret chiefs of the Third Order are guiding the team through, you know, this this ritual. And the ritual can only start if you're invited. And he believes that the Terry Wrist, David Christie communications were the team's invitation to yeah. begin this ritual. And then everything that's unraveling from the very beginning is apparently a guided kind of step or a guided nudge in, you know, sort of the the right direction, um, which, as he insinuates. Which from a um, an occult and esoterical sort of point of view, you could understand why he wouldn't want to divulge information because then he becomes part of the process that he is then part of that yeah. magic magical ritual which yeah if he is a magician and he has an understanding of these things he doesn't want to be part of this no um conflict which i think is interest, I, I guess absolutely yeah i think you're right extent. there is a conflict yeah. of interest but also it's about being dragged into something that you're not wholly familiar with that yes. yeah is Magic is one of the things that I didn't think was going to be coming up in this. And the, the real world sort of magic stuff where yeah. you, again, with the Alistair Crowley sort of stuff, you it's almost like um, redemption through sin. And they're, they've got yeah. a sin in order to reach these higher levels of consciousness yeah, that were, allows them... Yeah, sorry. I was just saying that because they were concerned what they would have to do as a sin to be, you know, kind of expect, accepted and taken to that kind of next level in the, yeah. you know, in the ritual, what would they have to do to kind of get to those, you know, to those kind of heights really, which yeah, mm. if, uh, anyone who knows even a little bit about Alistair Crowley knows that it's quite simple stuff and not many people would, yeah. yeah, not many people would probably be on board with it, but uh, uh. Yeah, so the um, certain, certain details make a whore blush, as they absolutely, say. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, and the rest, yeah, yeah, that's um, right, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that was kind of my takeaway from it, really. I, I'm kind of on the fence with Greenfield. I mean, I'm, I'm going to finish the book, I think, before I make my kind yeah. of final judgment on the, him. And... The one thing that I will say that did change my mind about him being a fellow mine was his reaction to the footage that they showed him of their own experiment with regards to inducing an alien abduction oh, um, the past the um regression uh yeah the hypnotic the, the, back the hypnotic regression. that's it yeah yeah um that in itself is quite something to watch and you don't mm. i mean thankfully i guess you don't get to see the full 20 minutes of footage that yeah. they had for it, Greenfield yeah. to, to to view, but I'm sure somewhere online would be able to find it. Yeah. Um, but basically, I mean, did you want to, because you've got more of the details on that, I've but got, yeah, I guess I've got we'll a... just quickly dust over it. So, yeah, so this particular episode kicks off with the Greenfield interview that we've just gone over, and then towards the end, um, which is towards the end of the actual interview with him, the that they cut to footage that the... Uh, that the, the team had from back in 2012 where they were purposely trying to get abducted by aliens and they they call in a guy you know a third party um i did make note of his name later on in my notes but i haven't got it to hand sadly but uh lonnie his name was uh, lonnie. lonnie that was it lonnie some lonnie scott Lonnie yes, Scott, I think it was. I think it was Lonnie Scott. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so draw him in as a you know as a third party. He's unconnected to the team at this point, uh, but he comes in to basically conduct the backwards regression by way of hypnosis, and he he basically works on this volunteer, which again the the team know he's not part of the team. He's sort of a, I think he's a, a friend of of one of the the members, and um, and basically Lonnie Scott. Um, basically confirms that what they're going to be doing is conducting a, a spiritual abduction 
as opposed to a physical abduction, which is probably what a lot of the listeners would be more, um, you know, sort of uh, aware of, you know, when you're watching things like mm. X-Files or, you know, alien movies, you know, you get snatched into an alien ship and whatever. Um, whereas this is more of the... Sp- up. This is Yeah, exactly. Whereas this is more your mind and your your spirit basically is abducted. Um, so you're having like a, an out-of-body experience sort of thing, but you're you're able to talk your way through it. And yeah. uh, so, yes, yeah, so this, this guy volunteers and he's put into a, a fairly deep uh, uh, sort of meditation. Um, well, they, I think they call it a hypnagog- yeah. hypnagogic state is the way yeah. is, uh, is the term that's used for being for putting them into that sort of right. dreamlike sort of yeah. state where they're still conscious, but they're yes. under hypnosis. So uh, right. yeah. I, I believe it's called a hypnagogic state. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so th- this guy gets gets put under that, and the the hypnotist has uh, has obviously been given a line of questioning to kind of go down because they're obviously they're doing this for you know a specific reason, and mm. it, it seems to work. It's quite successful quite quickly, which if you're a skeptic could you know influence your you know, opinion of of kind of what because it's almost like you know when you see you know on the like Royal Variety Show, and you, you, someone gets dragged up from the audience, and he goes right when I click my fingers, you're going to pretend to be a dog, and he clicks yeah. his fingers, and they start barking around on the floor. It was kind of it was that quick that it happened. It it kind of had me going back into my skeptic mindset because I thought okay, I would have expected a little bit more of a fucking build up than just mm. right close your eyes, go to a peaceful place. And you're under, you know, I thought it would have been a little bit more, you know, kind of well, to it, but. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's, there is a thing about hypnotic regressions and, and, and such that there is the jury still out on it, basically mm. that is something that I would like to have a go at. Um, let's see what pops up, wherever it may be, but yeah. it's, it's a, I'm on the fence. Just to call I am on the fence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Still on the fence on that Still one. Still on the fence because, on that one. But, and yeah. I think that um, going back to Greenfield's reaction to it, I think was was what kind of turned me off of him being a Thelemite, was that he right. basically, he calls it unethical. He, he's like, and he even goes as far as to call Greg a cruel human. Yeah, um, putting the guy through it, yeah. Yeah, which and I thought, well, if he's a thelemite, yeah, and he, he sees the unethical it. side of it, then yeah, yeah it's um, unless it, that was a convenient, you know, objection, you know, to the experiment to kind of throw possibly, them off the scent, but possibly, know, but you could see the that you could see the anger yeah. in him with you, that, you and could see the almost he, disgust in in what he was kind of watching. He wasn't. He didn't feel comfortable watching it. That's the kind of yeah. impression that, that I got. But basically, this guy gets guided through a meditation, through a, a specific line of questioning that Greg and the team come up with. Um, this is obviously well before Hellier. So, but uh, it, it leads them, he, he basically leads them through an alien spaceship. So he's describing rooms, um, you know, the machinery that he sees, the, the kind of the, the sort of the decor, if you like. He even goes as far as describing the, the aliens, I guess, who are on board and, and kind of what they look like and what he's experiencing. And, uh, mm. you know, they uh, says they have like no bones and they're not, they're not greys because he would yeah. initially have expected to see greys. Yeah. Because that's they what he thinks that. of. Yeah, exactly. And he, it's weird because the group obviously believed in it, but they deliberately picked a volunteer that was a skeptic, which, which was yeah. at the point that. I started to kind of relate to it a little bit more because obviously with regards to this kind of thing, specifically hypnosis is I'm definitely on the fence kind of leaning on the whole skeptical kind of side Mm. more so at this point. And so for him, but then I guess anyone can say they're a skeptic and then pretend to suddenly be a believer. But if you take it on face value, that that's where I was starting to kind of more lean on the kind of believe belief side of it, because, you know, he was, you know, because they said to him, you know, do you believe in aliens? And he was like, well, no, not, I, I didn't, but, you know, I, I kind of, I do now because he, he wasn't crying, but 
you could see he was emotional when he was brought around from the hypnosis. He was, you know, he's very, yeah. very exhausted, well, very sort of emotional. The, hip, but... the hypnotist says that the the, the um, eyes, watering of the eyes is uh, a symptom of having been hypnotised. Um, but having been in a very deep meditative state myself, you come round and you are slow to come round. Like it takes you a minute to come back into the room. Um, it is, I've never been hypnotized myself, but having gone into a deep state of meditation yeah, or, and then coming out of it, it, I guess it would have that same sort of reaction. But what I liked about what Greenfield said was that and it, it, it's, it is the truth of it. There's two possibilities to this particular experiment. Either there is no, there's no physical aspect to the experience yeah. of being abducted, which allows the further possibility that it could be purely suggested mm. and therefore a false memory can be implanted. Yeah. Or they unlocked memories of his actual abduction. That he didn't know he had, yeah, because it had been deliberately kept because it had been wiped from, from his mind, which and that was the something... unethical bit that he didn't like, wasn't it? Was that well, if, what, the it? bit that the bit that he didn't like was that potentially what they've done is implanted traumatic, horrific memories yeah. in him um, by doing this, and I, I'll be on, I'll be completely honest, I'm on board with Greenfield on that one because it, in a way, is without fully understanding what it is that alien abduct abductees go through to try and induce that in someone yeah is really quite a big it's quite a big deal and i don't know if you know this but it's kind of a kind of a big deal (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it's like if if that was something that greg was um interested in pursuing then maybe Greg should have been to, the one to sit down in that one chair. to do it, yeah, true. You yeah, know, not to be the maybe, one behind the camera. And I get maybe it that, that was deliberate because they they were in it. They they come up with it. Maybe they wanted to pick someone who was a third party who was impartial to try and add a bit of credibility to it. Because if it was Greg that done it or one of the other team, then it could easily have been labelled as <laughs> you know kind of faked or whatever for you know the benefit of the you know the documentary or or their experiment um so that's why i kind of thought that they picked someone else and then to be fair to him he did volunteer now whether they you know fully you know made him aware of what was going to be happening you know that i you know that i don't know but um but it it was interesting anyway i mean i'm still on the fence with that with that whole thing if you know if i'm being honest but yeah um that episode for me was 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 a whole kind of you know i didn't really believe greenfield in the interview i felt that he was kind of interviewing them more so than the other way around who's been very reserved keeping a lot of information and i just think you know that was one of the interviews that i'd been looking forward to right from when we started this um and he didn't really offer anything up now whether that was a ploy to kind of get people to buy his book to try and read their own read their own stuff on the cipher or I, i don't know so I was kind of on the fence about that. And then they do this whole hypnosis thing, which I was still fairly sceptical about. So for me, that was that was a tough episode, you know, to kind of, you know, get through, um, which was kind of helped by, you know, the following one, which for me was kind of, it was a bit, I don't know how you thought, but it was a bit of a filler um, sort of episode because it kind of opens up with Greg, uh, receiving emails uh, from someone about Fay Folk in both Somerset, UK, and Somerset, Kentucky. Um, now, this is where it kind of got my interest because this was heavily referenced in again our friends at NAC uh, and yeah. their ep- version of this episode to the point where one of the guys actually got a, a tattoo. Um, but uh, Greg <laughs> is sent a PDF copy of a book called the rebirth of pan um and it basically explains and depicts the various origins um of the god pan and how he is referenced um in many different cultures 
and religions because it, it obviously mm. it offers himself up as a a kind of belief system in itself but he's also referenced quite heavily in other cultures and religions and yeah. that and so and obviously it's a i've think i've been able to get a copy of that same pdf for both you and i although i've not even began to <laughs> read it yet no um, it's still on, i've got it on my laptop at the moment yeah, i haven't same. had a chance to get to it it's going to be one that i'm going to have to print off and read through in in that respect it's, i mean it's only 180 something pages i think but uh yeah it's also it's quite it's quite full on but um the, the the bit that kind of jumped out at greg and i think this is why he was sent it was because it draws reference to the three-toed footprints that were found in Helia, which kind of kicked this whole documentary off. Um, and it also highlights the things that they call power names. Mm. And two of those in particular, which again, I think jumped out to Greg, was Pike and Parsons are both noted as power names. Now, for anyone that, that doesn't remember... Parsons is believed to be the actual surname of David Christie, who sent the initial Kentucky Goblins uh, emails. And Pike, I think they reference they link to Pikesville, Kentucky. And Pike which, County. And, and, Pike, yeah. and Pike County, which which makes up a lot of, of that area. So that that jumped uh, jumped out as well. Um and also with you know Pan being the god of rebirth, vegetation, woodland, etc that is, is kind of where a lot of this investigation kind of started. You know, you've got cave yeah. systems, you've got forests, you've got dense woodland around, you know, Kentucky and, you know, and, uh, and other, well, other counties within Kentucky, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I, I like the, the reason for why the author of that book chose the name Pan, because Pan basically means all. Yeah. So, and I think by this point in the documentary, the team are referring to everything that's happening as the phenomena. The so, phenomena. so the phenomena it. that it's yeah. like all of it. It makes yeah. perfect sense. It links that up in that way. It, it would yeah. be called all, all pan. Pan. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It just makes sense. Um, and and another thing that that they, I don't think they necessarily, and it's another connection they don't necessarily think of until this moment. But Pan, as we later find out, um, although we kind of already knew, um, mm. is that Pan is also referenced as the Green Man. Now, Tyler saw a carving of a Green Man in that tree in uh, North Carolina when he spoke to the the old lady in the in the building before he was seized by the Car North Carolina Police Department. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. you know, so, almost, so again, that's another seized. almost. So that's another, you know, sort of clawback. And also Pan is worshipped by, you know, Fey folk. And as we've discussed in previous episodes, not linked to Helia, but goblins are considered Fey folk. So mm. again, it's a whole connection, synchronicity, amalgamation of, of everything that we've, um, you know, that we've since sort of gone over. So that's so I thought that was quite... Um, interesting so the the group then off the back of this and everything else that they've kind of come to learn is they actually visit somerset kentucky but as a group so i think previously yeah. they've gone there as you know sort of one or two of them or whatever and uh and dana wants to make a fey altar mm. um which is part of the ritual that she tends to do in a lot of the locations that they visit and this is again something that helps um kind of set their intentions so why they're there who why they want to communicate who they want to communicate with you know the mm. fact that it's good intentions nothing ill-fated that kind of thing yeah that's exactly it is it is setting intentions it's allowing the the entities the phenomena that yeah. i think that's probably the best way we can describe it now as the same way as the team is Basically. letting the phenomena know that they're they are and they're they're out of goodwill that they're there out of respect and they want to communicate yeah. It's, exactly, yeah. It's kind of like the same sort of thing that you do with a Ouija board, sort of thing. The moment you put your yeah. hands on that planchette, you're opening up yourself to, to com be communicated is, yeah. with. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, she, she chooses all these various different things. I've 
uh, milk, honey, cinnamon, uh, cakes, white candles, yeah. all these sort of things are traditionally, um, they appeal to the Fae. Yes, so yeah. all the various different offerings that people would make to them uh, yeah. in the old world, in Europe, and in the new world, in America, and, and such. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they decide to set up and camp, they find a cabin, uh, which gives them the, the perfect reason for being in Somerset, Kentucky, because they were still worried about this whole secret society sort of thing, weren't they, really? And they were they worried were, about yeah. well, being they set, there. They, yeah, exactly. They set the altar in the woods um, just outside the, you know, the cabin that they were that they were staying in. They didn't do any, once she had sort of, you know, set their intention, you know, made the altar and whatever, they, they walked away and, and kind of left it as, you know, as you say, as, uh, as you know, as that offering. And, um, you know, because they're going to be spending obviously a few days there. So they want that to be for the, you know, for the whole period, not just to do a particular, you know, communication or, you know, whatever it, you know, whatever it may be. But um, the following day, they, they meet with a, a local museum owner um, to ask him about, local sort of sightings and because he he seems to be the one person that would probably be able to offer up anything like that because it's quite a weird sort of museum that he has Mm -hmm. um and he he mentions it basically everything from bigfoot to ghosts um and he he, funnily enough he mentions a secret society who meet up in the local woods yeah and it's believed that they wear robes they wear robes they do chants they make offerings he said there's been, you know, rumours of, you know, sort of sacrifices and, you know, and that kind of thing, although there's been nothing to kind of prove that. So you don't know whether that's just kind of the Chinese whispers of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, but that I thought quite, you know, quite interesting. Um, and I think there's another guy with him in the museum at the time when the, the, the team are, you know, sort of asking him these questions. I think his name was Nate. Yeah, I don't know if I remember he right was, he was um, Matey's... I can't remember what the guy's name from the no, museum. It was his friend who has his own podcast that's all about the strangeness of Somerset. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I that's what that was. Right, yeah. gotcha. I, I knew he had a, a, a way in somehow. But yeah, he basically believes that there are uh, quartz deposits under the ground. Um, and this is the explanation behind a lot of the phenomena Um which links it to a lot of hotspots within the U S it's basically anything with cave systems, quarries, mountain ranges, anything like that will have these heavily dense deposits of quartz under the ground. And he believes it's something to do with that. And the fact that it, it kind of, it, um, it enhances energy, but it also uh, conducts it. And that's why he thinks that a lot yes. of these places have these, sightings the strange goings on and these well, he, phenomena. he quotes the uh piezoelectric or uh, piezoelectric fe- effect yeah um which is when you take a large piece of quartz and you fire an electromagnetic um wave oh, through sweet. it yeah. what it does is it, it it distorts the energy that comes out the other side of it and then strange things seem to happen um, that's yeah, exactly, something that's yeah. worthwhile looking into the piezoelectric uh, effect. Um, again, yeah. it's one of those things. It's hard to explain it, but it's a fascinating concept, oh, definitely. Um, yeah, it definitely is. and it's it's um, repeatable experiment as well. So it is something it is, that exists, yeah. um, and it turns out that smack bang underneath Somerset is a huge influx of electromagnetic energy coupled with this large deposit of quartz and yes, that's, right, yeah. that's what's created these strange things that have happened like he describes his um i think he said his girlfriend she came out of the yeah. shower one day and the thermostat on the wall went moved over to the left moved yeah. down and then shot back up and then had like a yeah. like a wobble a wobble effect yeah. kind of like um neo in the matrix when he first dies in the, in the first yeah. one where he goes like this and it goes down the corridor like yeah, that. that's it yeah um and like yeah that kind of wobble wave effect kind of down yeah the wall. yeah so you know, like a distortion yeah. in time and space and everything yeah. else so yeah um and he seemed re- really sort of i thought at that point he was going to get on board with the team because it was like 
he had all this information. Yeah. The team had all this information. And together, it, like it was confirmed. Yeah. But they didn't seem to buy the the whole quartz thing. I don't know whether it was because it was a scientific approach or whether it was kind of too practical. But yeah. I, I mean, they, I mean, he brought forth a load of, um, he did bring forth like graphs compelling. and maps and stuff like this. It, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. It was a very good um, case for it. But I think the team would like they were planning on going in a in a different direction, weren't they? I think so. I think it, it didn't kind of fall into their, you know, sort of agenda, or you know, it didn't fall into what they were either hoping for or what they were planning to do. I, I'm not maybe I'm not I entirely sure. But they they did. I mean, they, they listened to it, and it was quite compelling what he came up with. It wasn't just a load of like hocus pocus, or you know, mm. like you say, he had graphs, he had maps, he had a whole science behind it, and it does you know, link itself to, you know, electricity pylons and, and other sort of energy fields that is linked with kind of Bigfoot and UFO sightings and whatever. So yeah. it, it definitely kind of made, made sense, but it didn't seem to resonate with the team. Certainly no. we learn in the future, you know, kind of episodes because mm. they conveniently end the episode with probably the best cliffhanger in the whole two seasons, but it's basically Greg sitting in his car, FaceTiming Amy, who yeah. was the sender of the emails that we went over towards the end of the last episode, which was basically confirming that there's like a wizard who lives in a cabin that has an elevator down to a cave system and women, she overheard women getting tortured and there's magic and human sacrifice and military involvement and, and yeah. all this kind of thing. And unlike, you know, Terry Wrist and David Christie, she actually exists and yeah. which she confirmed in her emails, but you know, to the point where they were actually able to communicate. And well, they she disappeared, didn't she? She like just went straight off the radar, kept didn't respond to any of the emails or anything for a like few that. Months, and it, yeah. And it turns yeah. out she was in lockup. She was she in prison. Was yeah, not long after she actually sent those emails to uh greg she got she got caught on a, a number of felonies which obviously she doesn't go into detail as to what they were but i think it was like breaking and entering and burglary yeah. which right which which is really really weird yeah. because when we was talking about liminality and, and people yeah. being on the fringe and, and uh, marginalized people you initially think that amy is one of those people yeah. that she's on the outskirts oh, her fellas in jail for something which was mentioned in, in one of the earlier emails. Um, she's now in prison for a couple of different felonies. Yeah. Turns out she's a third grade teacher. Yeah. Third grade elementary. That's not grade someone grade. that's marginalized. That's someone no. that has stumbled across something, yeah. started digging, and then it's all been piled on her to shut her up. That's yeah, what exactly, it sounds yeah. like. You've said you've said far too much, and we need to keep you quiet. Yeah. So we're we're chucking you in prison for some sort of felonies that we can't quite tie you on, but enough to get you locked up for. Yeah, because it was. Know, like, I like the surprise of Greg's in, uh, the Greg show when like you're a teacher, like because he already yeah, had because yeah. he had that same assumption that she yeah. was one of these marginalised people. You know, she lived in yeah. a trailer. She's probably involved in drugs or crime or something yeah, like yeah. that because of all of this. And it's and like, well, it's well yeah. when uh, when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Indeed, isn't that yeah. right, Greg? You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. absolutely, but, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's and and that little interview, that little call, yields quite a lot of information and confirms a lot of stuff for them, for the team. Yeah. More so because the fact that she doesn't back down from her story. If anything, she actually gives more details to the story and like tells them to go yeah, to add, a very specific house. She does add more and, to it, yeah. Tells them a street, and, doesn't it? Or the, the, the street yeah. or, or the house on this particular street that's that got it. an elevator in the back that goes down into the caves. So she gives them like the house, the street, the number. She tells them exactly where like this elevator is, which is in like the bathroom, which that's is like, right, yeah. to us in the UK, the toilet. And the elevator leads down to basically the the, the, the cave. cave system below, which is where all this is meant to kind of yeah. be going on. And she's obviously they're... lost in prison. She's in like an yeah. orange, you know, she's in a jumpsuit. And and she probably, getting that knowledge, she, you know, 
broke in, entered illegally, yeah. and that's probably what they've been able to get her on. That's what they've been, yeah, now, they've got evidence of it, yeah. Obviously, the team are not going to pursue that because it no. means in, in like, being involved in criminal activity, and yeah, they, they're they not in a place to be able to do that. They can't be yeah. chucked in lockup. Well, no, exactly, no. And she, like someone Amy. who was in prison, I was expecting it to be very vague, almost like what Greenfield was, but she was still... I mean, there's a couple of times where she whispers or she kind of looks over her shoulder to see who's She keeps her voice low, doesn't she? Yeah. But she does like, she's, still she's tell talking him, like that, isn't she? Yeah, like, she's I'm talking, talking up to the little mic. But she does still tell him quite a lot. So, she, like I say, she's in prison. She video chats with Greg. He's sitting in, in his, his, his sort of his truck, you know, at the time of the call. Um, and I've made a note here that it's, it's amazing what they're allowed to do in prison. You know, she's been given a you know, Wi-Fi, a phone, you know, she can video chat, you know, kind of all this stuff. Yeah. Um, now, because he asks her a whole host of questions, for example, you know, where did she learn the term euphenol? Because she was only, aside from Terry Wrist, she was only the second person that had communicated with the team to use that phrase. Yeah. Um, and also the word snuff. Uh, slough, sorry. Slough, yeah. Uh, not, not snuff, slough. Um and she claims that it's that basically it was via the internet. So when all this strange stuff was happening, like hearing the girl scream, seeing the the kind of the, the wizard, the you know all the all the, the sort of the torture and what she found in that cabin, she basically googled it like anyone else would, I suppose. Mm. And that's where she um, saw the term, and that's what and seeing all that stuff is what caused her to look it up and. She reckons that it was her Google history that partly helped her land in prison. Yeah, because she was landing, she was t- searching all this stuff. Those, those, you know, the powers that be that are, you know, keeping an eye on our, you know, internet usage, kind of come across. Mm-hmm. Her she's onto something here, and that's how she believes they they got her. But basically, after yeah. retelling, we w- we won't go over it again because we already did in the last episode. But she basically retells a lot of the same incidents in her emails to Greg again like over the phone. Um, and he basically confirms Tyler's trip to North Carolina and seeing the green man in the tree and, you know, kind of whatever. And she, like I say, she retells basically a lot of the incidents and they immediately think that Amy is also talking about a similar underground system of people who worship the green man, i.e., pan mm. uh, from what she saw from what they've since found out about pan's involvement or you know who may worship him you know the, these weird folk in this little town in north carolina um although and and he so greg tries out this theory on her to see if there is that kind of that connection and she doesn't seem to have any idea or any sort of concept of what pan is or even what the green man is or the she actually had- She's actually talking about green men, i.e. little, little green, green men. men. So either goblins or little aliens. But in her initial emails, the team read it to, to be the green man, i.e. Pan. So that's where yeah. they thought they had a lot of their, you know, sort of connection. So you could see that Greg got a bit deflated at that point because it kind of removed a possible synchronicity, in, you know, in this whole... Um, but, it, but what it does do, it brings them back to goblins. It brings little back to the green goblins, men, which was the initial purpose or the initial thing that set them on this whole bloody journey, yeah, you know, in the first place. So it was good for some reasons, but you know, but sort of bad for you know, for others. Now, in the same call, Amy doesn't confirm who Doug is, who she mentions in one of her latter emails, mm-hmm. um, but she does confirm that he knew Greg would be able to help her. She wouldn't tell him, you know, kind of what he looked like or anything like that but what she did confirm which i thought was really weird it was just like who's doug he's like well i can't tell you that i can't tell you what he looks like or how i know him but he knows you and then she's yeah. like well, what i can tell you is that area 51 is not in new mexico but in actual fact it's in somerset kentucky and it's like where the hell does that come from he's asking you about who the hell doug is and yeah he just offered up this bit of info that he's supposed to, like this doug supposedly tells Amy that Roswell is basically a cover-up and there's nothing in New Mexico and that it's actually all in Somerset, Kentucky. And at this point, I'm thinking, right, okay, well, this lends itself very conveniently 
to the fact that you're talking about underground experiments, military involvement, cover-ups and all that. That's, yeah. that's quite convenient that you throw that in at this point. Yet yeah, there was no mention of it in your initial emails you know, to Greg, when you consider that you offer up so much information, yet you unless left that out. Unless Doug has told her, if someone asks you who I am, Mention you this. need to say this. Yeah, but again, I don't, I don't Maybe. know where. It didn't offer any relevance to... No, but it doesn't, know. This is the thing. This is the thing with all of this. It offers okay, no just... relevance yeah. at that moment. But it's it's later on down the line. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. It's later on down the line that they they harken yeah. back to it and they go, that's what that means. But, you know, it's like it's not, it doesn't make any sense to us right now. But if yeah. there's a season three, it may make some sense. Yeah, it was. You know. Yeah, because maybe they use the numbers. Maybe. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, possibly. It, I, I don't know, but yeah, it's. I mean, the team, I think, were kind of on my wavelength because you could tell they didn't really take her seriously at this point. Um, and you could see it in the dock, the way they react and the way they sort of take it all with a pinch of salt because obviously Greg records the, you know, the conversation because um, then she then goes on to claim that the phenomena has led her in jail and that Greg should investigate quietly. Um, but then I thought, well, if Very that's the case, why would she do a video call Firstly, and secondly, why would he then broadcast it in a documentary to be put out to the masses if well, there's any truth or belief in? Because we know what his apprehension is with getting involved in in this kind of thing. Because he's just a paranormal guy. This real world stuff is a little bit, you know, outside of his comfort zone. In his yeah, expertise, which he knows I think, quite often. I think you might be looking into that a little bit too much because this the whole Hellier thing is there them documenting their journey throughout this so it's the, what they've done is they've put everything into it they've allowed us to see every yeah, single aspect I, of it I, I don't know even but... to the point at which after he makes that call and then shows the rest of the team they all go why the hell did you do that here like we I, I know that in this cabin we don't have great receptions but you've gone and done it like 100 yards down the road yeah like if what she's saying is true. They are all around us. They being yeah. well, he says, this uh, weird cult thing. They know that we're here. They know, and they're closing in on us. Why would you do that here? Well, she says the cabin that they're talking about is only a mile, in you know, in sort of that direction, and actually point, you know, sort of to where very, you know it's going to close, going to be. So yeah, and that's why I just sort of thought, well, I don't know. It, it, it does lend itself to the fact that they didn't necessarily believe her at this point or don't really, they're taking what she says with a pinch of salt. I think probably mm. because she's in jail and you sort of think, well, why are we going to listen to a crook? You know, I think that was kind of the impression that I certainly got from their kind of reaction to it. But I don't know. It was funny because like their reactions were all a bit mixed because Tyler, as Tyler does, just got excited and was like, oh, if it's only a mile Let's away, go. why did you tell me that? Let's go. Like, you know, and investigate and... You know, Dana, Dana and Connor were quite anxious and were like, why yeah. did you have that conversation here when they're all around us? They probably could have heard that conversation. They know that we're investigating them. They know that we're here in Somerset. You know, so they were a little... Yeah, I, I, and I fully understand yeah. their, their and, side of it. Greg was kind of... He generally didn't know or didn't seem to know kind of what to think at all, really. He was kind of like... I don't know how to take what she's told me. I, I don't know whether to be concerned about the fact that we could be a, a mile mm. walking distance from, you know, the, the, the cave where this is supposed to have happened. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't know. And then, and this is actually where they then re-show the clip again of that guy from 2012 um, who does the hypnosis and the alien abduction. Um, they interview him again. And... They basically, you know, sort of say, you know, do you do you believe do you believe in aliens? And he's kind of like, no, not really. Like, I, I still don't believe it because he can't physically remember what the hell exactly happened what during happened that, there. you know, hypnosis. Yeah, the um, that I think that, that they basically show him the clip. 
So you can see in this clip, they're showing him again the previous experiment that they did. And it, and the guy's watching it. I mean, if he's an actor, he's a good one. But he basically watches it as okay. though he's like seeing it all, you know, as though it's all sort well, of for the first time. It's like what, he's, it's yeah. like what he says. He, he, he doesn't remember the details of it. He doesn't yeah. remember actually being on the ship or anything like that. But he remembers. But what he does know is that every time this comes up in conversation, he gets a really, he feels really, uneasy. really uneasy. Yeah, well, it's which, four years later um, yeah. that they question him on what he remembers of the night. And he basically says he remembers nothing of the session. All he remembers is that he was asked to turn up at this location and film something for Planet Weird, which for anyone who doesn't know is Greg and Dana Newkirk's uh, sort of website for the, their mm. traveling museum and their weird and wonderful exhibit and, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, Lonnie Scott, yeah, who, who was the hypnotist um, doing it, um, basically says if you can be hypnotized um to conduct everyday tasks like like we were joking like you know hypnotized to be a dog or hypnotized to go and carry out a certain task like brush your teeth or do this or you know whatever mm. and he's like you know then why can't we use it to contact spirits or you know travel to other worlds and, and this kind of thing so this time, Cole Pfeiffer, the producer, offers mm. himself up uh, as a as a, a willing participant to basically go into a state of hypnosis, which I think is quite clever because he's probably out of the group. He's probably one that's least connected to a lot of what goes on because Greg's received all of the emails and all of the contacts that led the team. Yeah. To they are Connor and Dana have been doing Estes methods and you know, various spirit boxes and, and, you know, communications and whatever. Whereas Carl's mostly just been there. He's experienced a lot of it, but he's just been kind of in the background recording. So he was probably the best participant out of the lot, I'd say. That or the other cameraman, Rashad. Um, but he... he basically... This one, you... It, 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 what, I've, what I liked about that one is it's it was kind of short, sweet... Short. Ish, yeah. to the point um yeah. I mean, it's definitely worthwhile um watching all of this it's worth because, people watching definitely yeah i mean we're, we're going to kind of paraphrase with this and kind of gloss over it but basically we'll have to yeah yeah but in the, in the interest of time he yeah, definitely, yeah. basically he seems to be in contact with some sort of mantis like creature like praying mantis sort of okay, thing which yeah. is Something that has come up before, praying mantis type aliens is something that yeah. has come up with contactee and abductee yeah. experiences. Um, it says something really on, ominous, and that was uh, whatever is coming next is going to be big, and they're going to know that it was them that did it. Yeah. Um, and he also receives this this image or images of windows being blown out. And shattering glass yeah. and, and everything else. So that in itself sounds like, oh, okay, it's going to be a Ooh. fucking explosion or something like that. Well, is it, yeah, because Lonnie started, Lonnie Scott started off the, the session by basically jumping straight in and saying, by asking him, what is going on in Hellia? To which Carl replies, a gateway. Um, mm. And he, he, he pro Lonnie Scott tries to probe Carl for more info, basically saying, well, the gateway to where? And Cole simply replies to other places. Um, he, Lonnie asks him whether it's open, um, to which Cole says, no, it's closed. Um, and he, <laughs> he says, no, it's closed, um, but are we supposed to reopen it? And this was the bit that made me laugh because the camera is kind of filming Carl answer these questions and Dana is sitting in the background. Yeah. She's shaking her head and she basically <clears throat> mimes, absolutely fucking not. <laughs> like, we are not opening any portal. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Um, which, yeah, I say did, uh, you know, did make me laugh. And then when Lonnie asks him why would we need to reopen it, Carl says to let them out. And that's when the camera pans around to everyone in the room and they're just like wide-eyed. Oh, and like, Fuck that. Nope. That is a no from me. 
Um, uh, there's something else was happening there as well. Like as they were doing this, asking the questions and Carl's giving his answers, they start hearing footsteps upstairs. And not upstairs. just like and you can you can hear it because I you heard had it, it on boom, boom. well, I had it on, on the laptop and I was listening to yeah. it on this, and you can hear yeah. someone walking around. Well, Connor says it's they'd been staying there for a few nights, and he said it, it wasn't the sort of the creaking or the sort of movements that you'd expect from a, an old house or a, a log cabin. He said it yeah. actually sounded like definitive footsteps moving from one place to another in the upstairs of the property to the point where the cameraman, I think it's uh, it must be Rashad or, or Greg actually, actually points the mm-hmm. camera up to the ceiling, and I think he looks round to the stairs that lead up to it, mm. in, probably in expectation of someone actually. You know, kind walking of walking down. Uh, walking down. Yeah. Um, now it gets a bit specific after this point, uh, even you know, even more so, um, because then Lonnie Scott asks Cole what happened to injured cold, because if you remember at this point, as far as we're concerned, we've been told that injured cold has died in an explosion. Um, now I I couldn't really make out what his response was, and I did have to rewind it sort of a couple of times, but it sounded like he responded with injured sick, which could explain his kind of absence and and why. Yeah. So he's he's not dead from an explosion, but he's actually, you know, sick. Uh, This is when... this action. Yeah, this is when the team actually hear the movement upstairs um, in in the cabin as the question was asked, and then they hear the footsteps, and then Carl responds. Um, he then asks Carl what happened to David Christie, and Carl says he's dead. Um, mm. The the no, it's weird because when he when he goes into this hypnosis state, he's basically in a dark room, uh, and there's a doorway and a bookshelf, and he basically says because um, because then. Uh, Lonnie Scott says to Carl, well, how do you know this? And he says, the books in my, the books in my space told me. And that's where they mm. determine that he's actually got a bookcase in his hypnosis space. That yeah. basically spells out that David Christie is, is, is dead. Um, and he basically confirms that the goblins are the gatekeepers. So the gateway that he sees is essentially being guarded by the goblins that David Christie supposedly interacted with back in, you know, Hellier, Kentucky. Mm. Um, and he, he then goes on to basically say that the goblins exist because the gate exists. So they've got no other purpose than to protect the gateway, basically. There's the, no other. Yeah, he calls them moment. a byproduct, doesn't he? He calls them a yeah, byproduct. Right. They, the gate exists, yeah. therefore a gatekeeper must exist. Yeah, exactly. And that's just what they are. That is their purpose, yeah. Apparently you can only access the gate if you are summoned. Um, it doesn't confirm how, um, but says that they have to offer bread, which was yeah. quite random. Although Dana had been off making offerings of like honey and various other like you know little trinkets but he specifically like yeah he specifically says that bread is offered um but he doesn't know how they they are uh, summoned but that's the thing as well that bread could also be symbolic so it's the idea yeah. of like breaking bread with someone it's yeah. just it's a metaphor for yeah. accepting them into your house and and eating food with them so if, yeah or if you go down the religious route then bread could obviously be a body could be a the body of Christ, sacrifice, the... yeah, which would lend itself yeah. to, you know, what Amy was claiming with the, you know, human sacrifice. So is that what they're doing with these people out in the woods? They're offering a human sacrifice to gain access to this gateway. Um, you know, that's it's a possibility. Of, uh, that's kind of where my, you know, mind went. Um, now Lonnie Scott at this point then directs Carl to go through the door that's in his hypnosis space and. This is where he he sees that there's there's someone there, you know, to greet him, which is basically a large praying mantis, and yeah, and they the, this mantis basically confirms what you said, um, just about the um, a, a large event will happen. He won't tell them what it is, but they'll know when it happens, and then that will then corroborate with this uh, uh, session, and that mm-hmm. they would that you know they were told. Um, 
and th- that was basically that was basically it from yeah from that session. I don't think there was anything. Um, I, I think he says something about. So he's already been told about. Uh, I think he says he sees the image of a pyramid, or something, and a water fountain, or something. In in when, when this door he talks up. he talks about the fountain, but he gets the image of a pyramid with a light beam coming out the top of it, like right, yeah. like the one in in Las Vegas. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then it turns out that in the town of. Of Somerset, Somerset, there's yeah. a well yeah. that they say if you drink from this natural spring, you yeah. will gain wisdom and return to Somerset. Yeah. And behind it is it's a pyramid. It's a stone pyramid like statue or a monument type thing. Yeah. Not, nothing like in Egypt. It's on a much smaller scale. But <laughs> much, much smaller. Yeah. It's still, um, it's still quite, it's quite sort of big. Yeah. Um, still significant at the very least. Yeah. At the end of that episode, um, they they actually do another Estes method um with a Frank box. Um mm. but that doesn't that doesn't really it's really weird offer anything up. what they essentially determine from basically doing this Estes method is that the injured cold that Woody Derenberger met is the same injured cold that Terry Rist supposedly met. When they had that meeting in the uh, the restaurant, although both have been described as being completely different, one was quite passive and welcoming, the other one was quite threatening and sort of dark and mm. shut offish. Now, whether that was because of the individuals that he was meeting with, or or what, I don't know. But basically, depends on who's looking. Depends on who's looking exactly. But <laughs> but they determined that yeah, the injured cold, it was the same one that met both. You know. Woody Derberger yeah. and uh, Terry Wrist. The voice introduces itself as Michael, um, and they basically lose their mind at this point because they basically tie it back to um, the Archangel Michael. Yeah, uh, because he says the angel, like like they say. The angel. Um, yeah. How do we have we met you before? Do we have we spoken? How do we to know you, you? Yeah. And he says the angel. Yeah. Which. And now this was this was interesting because um, before they did this Frank's box, um, it, it's worthwhile mentioning as well. The Frank's box is slightly different from the Estes method in that the yeah. spirit box itself was specifically made by um, a gentleman called Frank Sumption. Now he only made about two hundred of these before he passed away. Yeah. So and you couldn't purchase them; you had to be given. One. He was given. Yeah, he gifted them. Yeah. Yeah, and he. And turns out that the new Kirks were lucky enough to receive one of these things, but it's uh, it's a different experience from the regular sort of spirit box that they would use. Um, and the the thing that I found was maybe o- that put Tyler open to suggestion yeah. was Connor um, had brought some talismans or ma- medallions. Um, from his own faith from catholicism yeah and i don't know whether or not he gave them out to the to the entire team but he gave one to tyler that was of saint michael yeah that's right now obviously saint michael mark and the archangel michael are from what i understand two different things i believe well tyler seemed to believe that they were one of the same which is why which is why he lost his mind because he said out of all the pendants that he could have given Connor as a gift, the one that he picked the other way was around, the, the other one. Oh, sorry, yeah, Connor gave to Tyler. Yeah. He said out, out of all the ones that he could have gifted, the one that he picked was was that one in particular, Saint Michael. Yeah, and then they're taught. Yeah, so I, I, the way they kind of reacted and lost their minds to, you know, to that. Um, that information suggested to me that it was one. They were actually one of the same, but. I, like you, I, I don't know. I don't know for sure. I don't know too much about no. Catholicism in in all honesty. I mean, but yeah. what I did, I found that that particular um, experience was very, very odd because Tyler's voice completely changed. They did it's like he started talking. It. Yeah. It's, it's like he started talking in this really weird accent. It was like a weird, and, like, oldie English kind of. 
accent, which he only put on during that session. He'd never done it before. He'd never kind of alluded to it. It was like it was like the moment that he put it on. That's when this voice came out of him. Exactly. And yeah, involuntary. It's, it's probably because I've, I've never experienced one of these spirit boxes before or the Estes method, but surely because obviously the headphones are using the noise cancelling and the, the 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 cycling through all those frequencies must get to the point where you can't even hear your own voice he might this voice just might be coming out of him might just might very well just be channeling out of him um but yeah that's that's an odd one is it's interesting to see tyler's reaction when he's coming out of it as well yeah. in comparison to other estes methods that didn't use this frank's box well, some that he's um, done, some that he's done before that like, he felt very, he felt very uncomfortable um, and very sort of uneasy. And towards the end, he said that he could feel like a vibration c- coming through the headset that then travelled yeah. through his body that made him feel very uneasy he's, to the point where he, he just got the this, headphones off, didn't he? That's right. He got this noise and, going, yeah. and that he felt felt it through his entire body, like yeah. it was. Even now, that kind of gives me a bit of goosebumps just thinking about that sensation and, and seeing his reaction from yeah, it. It's he's, a he's very visceral quite, reaction. He's normally quite cool, quite calm, and you know, very excitable about doing this sort of thing, which is why I think he jumped at the chance to you know to do it. And he's he confessed to doing a lot of those types of experiments before, mm. but not necessarily with that machine. And he was, yeah, he was very kind of disturbed by it. He felt very uneasy. I think we saw, I think emotional. we saw a very vulnerable tile. Tyler there yeah you know yeah, I think that's what yeah. we saw yeah definitely. and I think that's I'd agree. that for me adds a little bit of, like credibility to it that yeah I don't think Tyler was having it on or putting on this voice because well, if he was putting on this voice to keep it going for a good 30 minutes to keep it consistent he's done good yeah yeah if yeah. he if that's if that's his thing then yeah, well definitely. done to him but because he's, yeah, exactly, he's certainly yeah. convinced me, that's for sure. Yeah, well, I, I laughed at first, but only because they were mocking him. They were like sort of whispering, like, where's this strange coming? voice? Is he putting this voice on? Like, why is he talking like that? They didn't quite understand it. But I think when they realised what he was responding with, they then were like, oh, shit. Oh, and they sort of okay. took it, you know, a little bit more... Um, a bit more seriously. Yeah, especially when he mentioned Michael and the angel and... And that kind of thing. That's when they all sort of lost their minds. And I couldn't really understand. I couldn't really understand why, but it was only until Connor sort of said about the pendant that he'd offered him and there was that link. But then I sort of thought, well, that's a bit of a tenuous link to lose your shit over. And I don't I didn't really pick up any other kind of well relevance. But again, I know, you know, things like this might come out in, you know, if they ever do like a season three, for example. The, the one me, thing that keeps really, the one thing that keeps in, uh, I keep in the back of my mind when I when I'm watching like these these different experiments that they're doing is the trickster element. That's the one thing that, that's that's sticking in the back of my mind that there's there's something there that this that Michael uh, yeah. whatever it was yeah. that he just his reaction to coming out of it yeah. was almost like it was done at a spot. When I think about it. What I get like this, 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 this energy of like, oh, like that, that, yeah. like yeah. it was an attack of some sort that he was supposed to feel. Yeah. So like it was like you're not supposed to be getting out of this yet. It you was know, done deliberately. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like he, he knew that it, that he was bringing himself out of that that sort of mode, yeah. and because of the way this particular box is built, maybe it was another avenue for this yeah. phenomena to have a go at him and. I think for me, yeah, I don't trust. I don't trust these things that they potentially are communicating with. I think it's because no. it, I've just got this idea that the trickster is yeah. there, and obviously you can never trust that trickster element, that trickster spirit, whatever yeah. it is. And I, I just think that the trickster element's so heavy yeah. on this. It's funny, yeah. It's funny you said it because that does kind of lend itself you know, to kind of my conclusion of, of this whole thing, um, which we, we we can go into because, to be honest, it was quite a disappointing finale, I think, for me, considering they're not doing other seasons. Like, if they were to do 
a season yeah. two and you knew something was coming, then you would know that it was maybe building up to something. But to say that this could be it for you know Hellier and you know and this whole phenomenon, mm-hmm. to me, I was I I felt I felt a bit disappointed. Um, if, if I'm honest, but for, for context, for for the listeners, basically what the team do is after the session with Tyler, they basically decide to go all go into um, another cave, uh, one of you know obviously one of the caves in, uh, in in Somerset, and basically do they basically try to invoke the spirit of Pan? They try yeah. to encourage the, the the god Pan to basically come and communicate with them. And there's a 16 point ritual that Dana goes through um, to basically try and let the phenomena know that they're there. Again, it's like setting their intention. It lets, it lets, I say him, it lets them, Pan, know that they're there, you know, kind of what make their presence known, um, you know, and also you know make offerings and set intentions and, and that kind of thing yeah now we're not gonna sit and go through all 16 points because it was a little monotonous after a while i'll be honest um <laughs> and it was just like all right i can go i get on with it like we yeah did. I, I, yeah i knew but you'd was, take that sort of stuff so like, i knew it <laughs> say, yeah <laughs> but um yeah yeah i don't I, for me it was a bit it was a bit wishy-washy really because fuck all happens basically they they well cool i mean yeah it, nothing the thing happens, is though, let's be honest they don't get any communication there's nothing there's nothing physical that happens that's the thing there's nothing that well, happens within this material realm aside and from them you... feeling uneasy when they because one of them has the idea of playing the tones that we mentioned earlier yeah. on and so they they play the the tones in various different forms because I think Connor had... and this is after they've invoked Pan. So the the rituals so the come ritual, to yeah. the thing and they're still within their magic um, their bubble. protection bubble energy the, bubble because they've isn't it? Yeah. walked the circle and everything for protection and everything else. So basically, and this is when they do play those three tones and yeah. they all start getting a bit nauseous and a bit sick and well, they Greg get quite specifically, deflated. It, it affects him quite a lot to the point where he's sitting with like his head between his knees saying that he feels anxious and he feels really uneasy. I kind of got the impression that Tyler kind of started to say the same because he wanted to like, it was like, Oh yeah, no, I, I, I feel like that as well. Yeah. But I didn't really buy that. He felt uneasy. Do you know what I mean, like Greg, yeah. Greg sort of committed to it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like he, yeah, he sat down, you know, he, he looked uneasy, put his head between his knees, you know, he crossed his arms over and, he was saying, like, guys, you know, I feel really anxious. I feel really uncomfortable. And yeah. and it all started when the tones were playing. And Connor had done a number of different sequences because they didn't know if uh, the tones had to be played in order. So boom, boom, boom. Or whether they all had to be played together to make one continuous sound. Mm. And so Connor had done a few different variations and played them all, you know, kind of together. But it was only at that That's point right. that they started to feel... You know, kind of uneasy, but by this point, I'd, 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 they'd lost me at this. You'd point. switched off, and yeah. Like, well, well, this is so, this is the point that I don't think that they right. did the ritual correctly. And I, don't get me wrong, I'm no expert on it or anything like that, but I don't think they got the intention right. So the bit where, uh, like, they've after they've invoked Pan, the idea is that they are then supposed to break bread with him, with, with it with pan the phenomena whatever it is so with that they are supposed to drink wine eat food be merry laugh and joke and and the celebration between them yeah. is supposed to invite pan into it but what they did straight off the bat was it, was all very what it seemed to be what it seemed to be in the documentary was they started swigging the wine having a bit of food but they're all like oh, we're really frustrated because fuck what was happened and oh, like yeah. that and then and then what kind of made me like cheer up a little bit is our good old friend tyler was like look this ain't the right mindset guys let's get up oh. let's have some fun because you know what we're here we're here right now we need to get oh, our so own energy been... up yeah, and i think that's what that is because i don't think there's little whispers of things that happen where they go, like Dana says, the, the energy felt like it came 
something came in from deeper in the cave. It got yeah. colder, felt the energy rush in, the hairs stood up. And... Yeah, Connor notices the temperature drop in. And then a, a few times, doesn't he? About the energy uh, shifting. Mm. And yeah, but it, the, the ritual started off all quite somber because first off, they had to make their presence known. Um, the second the clap one, in the clapping and like the, the, but it wasn't like whooping and cheering. It was basically just like a slow clap of just like, exactly. You know, so it started and... off on a negative point, And then the, the second one was to remove all iron. But then they, but then they were making compensations already because they were saying, well, you know, we're going to remove jewelry and, you know, any, any sort of accessories that we're, that we're wearing that might be iron. But of course, mm. we can't do anything about the cameras and the other equipment. So that's just going to have to remain. So then I thought, well, you you failed the ritual from the start because you haven't yeah. removed all the iron as instructed. You've you've just removed what you can or want to, you know, remove, which I thought was just weird. And then yeah, step three was the clap when approaching the actual cave, as mm. Pan doesn't like to be surprised apparently. So this is a warning to him. I keep saying him. I don't even know if it is a him, but I know, right? It's it's, it's weird, a, isn't it? It's a warning to Pan that you're approaching and that you're gonna you know, kind of, yeah, that you're going to uh, be there. And then step four um, is uh, is to create a, or cut, sorry, cast a circle, which is you're basically creating an energy circle around you as, as kind of protection from the energy that you're sending out, but also any stuff that you might be um, getting back. That's something that you do... In I know any you do that sort of anyway, magical, yeah. magical sort of yeah. sense. Um, like even yeah. if you, even when I'm going into my meditation, I have yeah. like a. Well, some uh, use a, light energy, don't a they? sort of ritual that would pre- technically protect yeah. me in some sort of form. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah. I think without going through all of the steps, of, well, I've only of I've only written ritual. down the first five because. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, so the the next one was then to create an altar for um pan which would be in the center of the um the ritual space and that would i think that would also involve uh, candles and setting them in um four corners of your circle or creating four four corners four corners which, yeah. which would represent each of the the elements and and so they they did yeah they they they, they did yeah did all this um but yeah i just they they claimed to break bread with Pan by you know eating, drinking the whiskey or the wine, whatever it was they they took. Yeah, it's wine. But it felt like they'd done it too late. It was almost like they'd admitted defeat, and then they chose to break break. That's bread. exactly that's exactly my were. point. But yeah. The, the thing that I was like, oh come on, it was that bit when that you referred to where Tyler sort of said like you know you know, I feel frustrated, you know, I feel like we've not achieved anything. I feel like being here is a waste of time. And and that, and that kind of, that's not word for word, but that's the kind of thing that he was saying. Mm. But then he was like, but is that, is that part of the ritual? Are we supposed to feel like this? You know, does it mean that we can't communicate with him right now? And I was like, oh, come on, now you're just trying to make it fucking fit. Well, no, trying I think to make what it he was saying, the agenda, like, and that's I think what, what he was me. saying was that, well, what we need to do is we actually need to celebrate and celebrate that we're here right now, that we've actually, all of us have come on this journey together. Even if nothing's really happened, we need to celebrate regardless. And I think that's, yeah, that but, in yeah. itself is, that's his opt to, that's that, that's that, bottled enthusiasm that is Tyler that yeah, positivity I, I that I, I can get on board with I, I, I didn't because buy that I think it is it. I think it is that that sense of positivity that really needs to be pushed forward if you're going to try and invoke something like this and try and if this is right if the yeah. the the invocation of pan is an old ritual yeah. and it's something that um, people have been doing for a long time. So think about how the ancient cultures might have done it. So, so for instance, the Celts. Yeah. The Celts, they love a party. You know, every yeah. festival or an invocation or something like that, it's all full of emotion and energy. And so they would have been walking up to that cave with the 
with the the pitch torches going, and they would have been singing, they would have been dancing, yeah. they would have been banging on drums and everything yeah, like exactly. that, telling Pan, "We're coming, we're coming to you." Yeah, I think I you're know. right in that there was too much of that somber sort of atmosphere. The team weren't really ready for it, it and I don't they weren't ready. They weren't prepared. They 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 didn't know what to expect, so they let that affect their mood, but. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd probably, I'd probably have to disagree on that point with with Tyler because you know, from my perspective anyway, you know what he's like from the the from the seasons leading up to this point, and he is enthusiastic. Mm. He's very gun ho. He's very just like fucking charging with both feet, and you know, just kind of, you know, get it done and whatever. But with that, it was just like it felt to me like he was trying to force his positivity, and he was trying to. Force yeah. the situation to give it a purpose. You know, like course, what I comment, yeah. like what I think it was in part one, where I said the same about the tarot reading. It felt to me like they were trying to make them, it was like they were trying to shoehorn the meaning of the cards into their situation at the time. And yeah. it, that's exactly what I thought he was doing with that situation. He was like, you know, we're all somber, you know. So is it the ritual telling us that we're you know, we're supposed to be feeling like that and we're supposed to be frustrated. But, you know, look, guys, let's, you know, we're here together. We've got to the end. We've, you know, we've we've come on this journey. We've come so far. You know, let's try and change it. And I don't know, he just felt like he was trying to force himself out of that mindset and and by extension, you know, force the, the kind of the team into it because they, okay. knew they were coming to a dead end and that they weren't getting anything so was he okay but to... that but that is is that necessarily a bad thing though because it for what they're trying to achieve yes from from my point of view because it right. felt like he was trying to force something like he wasn't okay. just he wasn't just allowing it to be somber he wasn't allowing it to be what it was that they were all frustrated that nothing happened that they didn't have any experience or communication and that they actually just tried something and after all this build up it fell flat instead of just allowing it to be that to me it, it it felt like he was trying to he was trying to like like just sort of force something he was trying to he was trying to give the negative outcome a purpose instead of just accepting it for what it was he was trying to give this whole different spin which yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a bad thing to obviously be optimistic and to try and be positive and mm. you know, try and look for the good in something. But for me, out of the whole two seasons, that was the one moment where I thought he was probably the least genuine he's been in the whole two seasons. Yeah, no, Personally. I'm not on board with you on that one, in all honesty. I think that's that is that's where we're going to disagree there because I I get I can get on board with Tyler's positivity there and trying to lead the team into a heightened state of emotion that because if they had I think that like what I've explained where they started they've done the ritual wrong because the intention that they've gone in there with has been almost clinical like we've got to follow these 16 steps these 16 steps are the key to this ritual the key to the, any sort of magical ritual from my own experience is the intention that you set. And that intention comes from your emotion that you're putting forward. So yeah. emotions have energy. And if you've got low emotions, you're going to have low energy. It's yeah. That is also a psychological sort of thing, as, as we know yeah. from various different um, mental health yeah. and, and the stuff that we've investigated ourselves, that yeah, if you've course, got yeah. low, low energy, you've got low the enthusiasm you've yeah, got the output is there's you've got absolutely yeah. so the product so what this if you're sowing yeah. a very low energy seed you're going to get very low crops oh so yeah no, I, I get that totally yeah. i think what tyler may have done at the end of that i've had that realization of right okay we're supposed to be breaking bread and but everyone's down nothing's happened there doesn't seem to yeah. be anything that's really happened here maybe actually what we need to do is we need to kick it up a gear and we actually need to celebrate something and yeah. in order in order to kind of kick start it again because if you do look at it from yeah. from that magical sort of perspective and not necessarily from say that like the materialistic perspective he is attempting to bring the team back up and bring the energy back up 
which could then yeah, move yeah. The, the ritual forward, which is potentially what yeah. is supposed to happen. He did do that, I agree, but for me, the way in which it was delivered and the, the point in which it happened, for me, just felt like it was dropped in deliberately because they, they he, he even commented on the fact that, because I've, I've made it my notes here, but at this point, yeah. I feel that nothing happened. And to give it meaning, the group was saying that nothing in, nothing happening was the point of the ritual. And it's like, we didn't fucking say that at the start, but now you're saying it because nothing's happened. So now you're trying to give it validity after the point. If they said at the start, you know, we're going to do it. And, you know, if nothing happens, then that's the, then that's the point because you can't just communicate with Pan that easily. You know, the ritual might not have been done right, or it might be the wrong time, the wrong location, blah, blah, blah. If they had yeah. sort of foreseen that at the start and that happened, then I'd probably be more inclined to agree with you. But because it seemed convenient that that was the mindset that they all took on, it was like, oh, well, we fucked this up. Oh, well, let's just say that that was the point. Nothing happened. Oh, I, okay. I, uh, you yeah. see what I mean? Okay. So they, they've tried to, like with the tarot yeah. reading that I referenced in, the, I think, the part one that we did, it mm. just it felt like they were, it felt like they were turning the negative result but, but, but saying like, oh yeah, well that was supposed to happen. Well, we, we you know we knew that was going to happen. Or and, and then he's then trying to reinforce that by saying like, come on, you know we've we've done this so, like we've done this journey, and you know he was trying to get them all out of that somber mood, which I agree with because that's what he did. That's what he was trying to do because that just seems mm. to be his nature. But for me, it just felt the timing of it was was wrong. In that sense, it felt like it it came. A little bit too conveniently because it's like oh, okay well here we go well you've you it's not worked you've not communicated with anything or anyone but you're now saying that that happening was the point do you see what i mean and so that's that's why i'm kind of like well no yeah. if you if you'd set your intention at the start by saying that if it wasn't going to happen okay yeah no, yeah i understand what, what i mean saying. so that's that's I where i am they, i think we're yeah, I understand where you're where you are. And I think maybe what the team's expectations were out of this particular yeah. um ritual was the similar far, sort of far more feeling they that got. they had yeah. at the end of season one, where where they did their thing, they did their experiment, and then all of a sudden everyone just got this sense of, well, that was that. What we what we've come here to when we've achieved what we set out to achieve, even though nothing's happened. Yeah. Is I think that's what people what they were expecting to feel this time round. And because they didn't feel it, that sense of frustration kicked in. Um yeah. and I'll I'll go back to what, what I said before. Really, I think they just didn't quite go in there with the right intention. They didn't go in there with the right sort of energy. Yeah. That um, I'd agree with, definitely. Yeah, they you could tell from think... the start there was apprehension, there was nervousness. Yeah, the, the, yeah, obviously a bit of anxiety because those feelings were heightened, you know, as they went through it. Mm. I, don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that they didn't know what they were doing because they obviously they do, and you know, obviously I've yeah. been invested in this very much so right from the beginning, but. There was a. I did get the impression that at certain points of the ritual, like with some of the steps that 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 Dana and possibly Connor as well, they either weren't invested in why they were doing it, or they weren't entirely sure how they should do it. And so I think that might have affected the, you know, the end result as well. You know, and I think maybe one of them, I get your point. Yeah, that makes I mean? perfect sense like, as well because because everything has brought them to this point. It's it's just been all over the place. It's been a literally a roller coaster that's brought them to this point, yeah. and they haven't been able to really pinpoint exactly what their purpose is. Yeah, and... I think so. But also, yeah, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, like in the Estes methods, for example, Connor was pretty much the ringleader because he knew about it. He'd done them before. And he, you know, he'd used that technology for more spiritual usage and whatever. And you know, obviously you got Dana with the tarot and the magic and, and everything else. So it all kind of made sense with who was involved at what point. But there was a point with one of the steps where Dana said, oh, I've been thinking about it for a couple of days. And actually, and I'm, it was not, the actual I'm not. the invocation, was like, wasn't it? Yeah. And she's like, I'm not going to do it. She's like, 
Greg, I think you should do it. And even on camera, he was like, wait, what? Uh, what? <laughs> what? And he even says in an interview, like, obviously after the event, he's like, he'd never done one of those before. He kind of knew what it was about, but he'd never actually, like, actively done one. And mm. so I thought, did that throw a spanner in the works? Because Dana sort of broke the ritual by handing over an element of it to someone else whereas there needed to be like kind of a ringleader who kind of set the intention started the ritual and saw all of the points i think because i think even to a point where there was one where they had to light candles around their circle which was the point where i think they represent each of the elements yeah i think greg lights a candle and i think she lit candles and something i said i mean obviously i don't know about magic rituals but I'm just sort of thinking out loud, really, I guess. And this was my thought at the time. I was like, have you broken the ritual by sort of passing it over to someone else who didn't know to his own mission what he was doing? I, so I I am very much inclined to agree with you there. Because I think you you I think you've hit the nail on the head there as well, in that I've got very, very limited um knowledge of of, of magic and and such but i understand the concept of it mm. at the very least and the concept of the rituals and, and such and that if you're the one i don't know i suppose if you're the one drawing the circle you got to be the one to do the entire thing because yeah. it's your energy that's gone into that circle it's your energy that's flowing around that ball yeah it should be you that be does you doing, the rest yeah. of it. It should be you that does the invocation. It should have been Dana that did yeah. the invocation. But I think she I sort think of passed Dana, the mark, didn't she? At the wrong, possibly at the wrong I point. Kind of felt like that she did that as well. Yeah. When I when I first watched it, I thought that's really odd. Why? Especially and her. I get I get her reasoning for it because it's the pan element of this investigation came from Greg. It's like Pan jumped out to Greg. Yeah. And like Greg started experiencing those synchronicities that brought him upon Led this from part that. of the investigation. Yeah. Oh, definitely. But, yeah, yeah. So I can understand her reasoning for it, but I think I think the team would need to do it again, but they would need to do it in a way that they brought so much collective energy. So if they if they yeah. rock, rocked up to that cave, singing and dancing and like banging on a little drum or whatever, rather than just clapping, yeah, and quite unenthusiastically as well, yeah, you know, exactly, like yeah. if they brought a, a collective energy, they yeah. they may have experienced something very yeah. very different like we say the energy that you put into something is the energy that you're going to get back and if it was all very kind of somber and 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 sort of dark and anxious and stuff you know to begin with that's exactly what they're going to get back which is like when they played the tones greg felt anxious and felt uneasy and you know a bit queasy and then it affected other members of the team yeah and so yeah i think it was for that point i think it was sort of doomed you know from the start sadly but you know this is coming from a guy who knows diddly shit about magic so i'm not going to sit here and confess to be sort of an expert but just likewise really and likewise just looking at it with you know kind of untainted eyes if you like and just kind of trying to apply some sort of layman's logic you know to kind of what they were doing without knowing Mm. the ins and outs of it that was kind of my you know takeaway and you know my kind of you know input you know with that i mean i'm glad they showed it because it it, in my opinion it, it it did fail and I'm glad that they did show it because it shows that they are genuine in their investigation um, yeah. and that they are willing to show the the pros and the cons of everything that they do. And, you know, just as a, I suppose, a disclaimer, just in case any of them do actually ever listen to this, you know, I do respect the guys and what they what they do. And oh, 100%. Their own, yeah. their own individual expertise and experience and whatever and, and what they all bring to, you know, the the team. and. You know, and and yeah, you know, Tyler is a favourite of mine. So I don't want if he's listening, I don't want you to take it the wrong way, man. But you know, because like you say, his energy is infectious, and you find that it's great when he's on screen. I'm sitting there and I'm 
I'm getting all bubbly and that with, and I'm like, yeah, come on, let's go, let's go into the <laughs> cave, and you know, so I do, I do get the right, you know, sort of vibe from him, but I just felt, yeah, I just felt that was that invest that, yeah, that that ritual, sorry, was it was wrong for all of them for different, you know, for different reasons, and mm. you know, they're they're probably you know new to it as much as anyone, you know, I can't imagine they do a sixteen point ritual every week, so you know, you've got to allow some sort of failure i mean this is the thing about all these about magic as well is that it may look like a failure right now and we could be completely wrong they may have done the, the oh i've the, done quite they, they may have done it yeah bang on perfect absolutely but yeah. exactly these, yeah. these sort of things they have legs it's, it's it's exactly the same thing that what greenfield was talking about with regards to the hero's journey yeah. in that you start the journey you go into the underworld yeah. you um you 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 are set your trials you come out of it yeah. but the time scale it could like you said it could be 10 years it could be 20 years it yeah. could be tonight it could be within one day there's exactly, no way yeah. of telling exactly no. how long it takes for the hero's journey to be fulfilled and exactly right potentially yeah. that's what this is really it's the archetypal hero's journey and and obviously that that connection wasn't lost on the team either no exactly so, no and um yeah, I, I, like I said, it, it, it was as far as we're as far as I won't, won't speak for you, but as far as I'm concerned, it did seem mm. like a, a failed ritual. And, and to me, that's fine. I'd much rather people jump in and try something and fail, but still document that failure um, yeah. and then not include it in the documentary because they want everything to be perfect and run smoothly. So like you say, it's, it's a bit more honest, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I, and I respect them you know, for that. And I'm also quite happy to be wrong if we ever get a season three, they backtrack and actually say, Do you know, what? actually that led us down this path or that led us to this bit of info or this feeling, which actually has this synchronicity or this connection. And then I'm yeah. bang, you know, I'm back in and back with it and I'll take it all back and I'll, you know, I'll happily, uh, I'll happily do so. But um, yeah, for me, it just felt a bit much like the ritual itself. The finale felt a bit flat, I think for me, um, you know, sort of in that, not that I was expecting them to walk in there and, little green goblins were going to walk out or you know some horned some, god some horned comes god in was going to walk in and be like hello <laughs> <laughs> hey, <You hold>. rang. <laughs> yeah <laughs> or, you know, i wasn't expecting anything like that but um of course not no. yeah i just think you know could they have maybe done another episode to wrap it up and end it on a bit more of a positive i don't know i think for that reason alone that's why they need to do a season three not that it ends on anything mm. Because they could quite easily leave it there and just say, look, we tried the ritual, didn't work. We didn't get any other leads that were worth pursuing. You know, that's it, you know, and they could quite easily leave it there. There's probably there's probably not much that they could sort of try and unravel if they did a season three. So it's only if stuff has been happening, obviously, behind the scenes that we don't know about, much like with how they came up with season two, that absolutely that they would get that lead. Um but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, season three, they could actually try and track down Terry Wrist. I mean, by this point, he's probably into his 80s, so, but they could mm. quite easily try and track him down. You know, David Christie, based on Cole's uh, uh, hypnosis, is dead, but they yeah. could try and communicate with him if that's the case or actually track him down. If he is actually David Parsons, maybe maybe they could use that spirit box and speak to his yeah, spirit. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. The only the only major thing they could do, and this is if they wanted to, is actually retrace Amy's steps and actually go to find that cabin, find the woods, you know, camp there for a night, see if they hear anything, you know, and, 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 and you know, and that sort of thing. That's probably mm. really the only thing. That I think that that they could do really in all in all honesty, I, I can't think of anything else. Any other, like I say, unless there's plenty going on behind the scenes that opens up this whole other world. Like they did another ritual that worked, and they're filming it at the moment, and they're just you know being coy. Um, you know, so because I follow, you know, we we follow our, our you know our Twitter page follows all of the yes. Elliot team on Twitter, so I see various updates where they because they do Q and As quite a lot and. Everyone all the time will ask Greg predominantly, when are we getting season three? Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming from his responses that things are happening and that they are 
looking into various things, but they don't want to approach certain aspects of it just yet. Which that's is fair the, enough, uh, really, because it could be potentially very dangerous. That's the know? vibe that I'm certainly getting. But um, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. But no, all in all, um, I suppose it's not really getting off the fence. We've kind of already done that, I guess. But I guess just as a, sort of, yeah. a summary, I suppose, I'd, I've thoroughly enjoyed Helia and watching the two seasons and getting invested in this and, you know, following the team on, you know, on their journey. And, you know, there's every chance that I'd probably watch it again, because like with anything, there's probably stuff that I've missed or, you know, on a second watch, I'd interpret different. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I would, um, you know, I'd certainly, certainly try that. Um and, and see if if something else kind of happens. But no, I, I think, yeah, it's definitely not about a goblin hunt in Helia, Kentucky. I think there's far more oh, to it. There's cryptid elements. There's paranormal elements. There's magic. Like how you kicked off the episode. There's, you know, human sacrifice. There's rituals. There's magic. There's there's everything. There's hypnosis. Abs- all, mm. all corners of, of that kind of spectrum all play a part in this, you know, mission. It is all. Um, it is, all, pan. it is pan, yeah. I mean, if I was to allow the sceptic of me kind of creep back, I would probably say that this is a, an ARG, um, you know, an alternate real, reality game, um, <laughs> and that the trickster is someone winding them up that's kind of giving them all, like a Dungeons & Dragons uh, dungeon master, you know, giving them all this Yeah, info. the dungeon master. Yeah. yeah, give them all this info, you know, t- wait them to see what steps they take and then saying, right, well, you've gone down this path. So that means you get this bit of information or this is your next yeah. path. Or, so that, that if, I, if I was to be the skeptic, then I'd say, yeah, that they're probably playing an a, a alternate reality game unknowingly. But the, the thing is, me- even, but even that's not you being, that's not even you being a skeptic either. That, potentially is a possibility that if yeah i mean take into account things like determinism where your fate is written in front of you mm. so this in like with all the synchronicities i don't even think that that even subscribes to determinism because essentially we still have free will to follow those synchronicities yeah, exactly. or not yeah. you know so yeah. i think that there is because I think when at the end of the, one of the previous episodes, I open up the question of the nature of reality and what that means for things like free will. If yeah. things are already being put in place within our own timelines that yeah. are set in front of us by something that live, that yeah. exists outside of this. But I still I think that yeah. there is an element of free will because you choose whether or not you, you want to follow to those synchronicities. Yeah. And exactly. No, I, I think I've got a, a possible theory that, and it kind of coincides with what Greenfield said. I think the phenomena might not necessarily be pan, but it might be the third order. That it might be these post humans that have been able to technically evolve mm. past what we are right now through. Mm enlightenment yeah they've been able to pass on to an existence beyond this that allows them to interact with this in order to um bring as many humans like Mm. what we are currently now into another existence that is essentially would be like the next step of evolution um or it might even be it might be even be us refinding that part of our being yeah that we, we have previously with. lost yeah because that is a, a strong possibility yeah that... that's, that's kind of touched on in greenfield's book isn't it which is why he mm. probably has that theory in the interview the his book touches on that and about us kind of refinding past beliefs and past forms by way of this cipher that was left by the last known version of us for basically our future selves to kind of find to try and get back to that um mm. so it's, yeah, kind, of, it's yeah. kind of a bit it's kind of a bit interstellar really a bit, yeah it's, it's a bit yeah you know where he finds out that actually it's the 
humans from the future that are now living outside of these dimensions yeah. that they they are post-human they're buying into it yeah i mean I'd, I'd much rather be on board with that than the fact that it is just a sweaty nerd in his mum's basement winding someone up with a <laughs> a fun idea for a prank that he had or something do you know what i mean so well, if it's if it's a mate if this is a prank this is the most the greatest, elaborate prank uh, ever like yeah. ashton Kudos. kutcher's got shit on this you oh, know like yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's one of those things that you've been helliard <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you've yeah, been helliard which i don't i don't well, think it is that, that could that could become a term let's be honest it probably could become exactly. a term. there's just too many yeah there's just too many people involved too many individuals too many stories mm. too many books that have been published for you know for this to be an elaborate prank so I don't know. I think, like I say, I, I, you say it's possible, but I think that's why I say that it, it's my skeptic side because although it's possible, it's a very elaborate possibility, even more so than the other possibilities that, you know, this is actually a secret organization known as the Third Order, you know, who are, you know, higher, you know, beings than us. You know, that, that I believe is probably more believable, I think, to me than mm. the fact that it is just some ARG that someone's thought up and it's just got a little out of hand. And no one's got the heart to tell them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean that? That's just kind of my, yeah, cynicism, skepticism, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, that, that, that was that's to be honest, that's the the one theory that popped into my head after watching the finale. I was like, they've, they've been taken for a ride, here. you know. And I, that, and I didn't want that to be the the everlasting thought of, of Hellier. So I've kind yeah. of read through other notes. You know, I've listened to you know, parts one and two again, I thought, no, do you know what? There's too much going on for this to just be that because there's just too many, you know, you, you know, using a favorite, fr- you know, word, you know, of this series, too many synchronicities, you know, too many people involved, mm. as I say. And, and so I think there's more to this story than we've currently been shown. I think there's even more to this than what, you know, the new Kirks and the team have been provided or have been shown. And I think it would be doing themselves a disservice if they didn't do a season three to kind of try and at least unravel some more of these threads and tie up some of the loose ends that have have so far been left. Well, what I think would happen with a a season three, it would open up more questions. And it's with anything that's like this, it's a rabbit hole that turns into a warrant. And <laughs> yeah. there's, there's two, you cannot go down every single tunnel and it just expands, expands, expands. And it's easy to get lost in those sort of things. You have to be selective as we have. What I like, research. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, what I like about for the team as well is they, they explained it a little bit earlier on in the season that everyone goes off and have done their own little avenues of, of research and they've all kept in contact. And the moment that they, detect that one of them is going down that rabbit hole a little bit too deep. Yeah. They pull them right back they out. And say, back whoa, in, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. Come on. We know these signs because we've been there ourselves. Well, we've done the Just same rain it back on episodes, haven't we? When we do our little pre chat, yeah. sort of pre record chat. And I'll say to you, mate, you've, you've gone down a bloody warren with that. Yeah. What, what you mean to say, we is don't need to not talk we've about done that. this. You've done that to me. Oh, well, I've done it mean. to you. And I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've done it. I'm sure it's been, uh, reciprocated i'm sure of it but, uh, <laughs> but no i yeah i mean as you say i have uh that's a you know rein you in a little bit sometimes I've, I've let you go off on the tangent and sometimes we've had to say now look we don't need to go over that we need to keep on topic or yeah but it's, it's the nature of what we research it is. you know it's the nature of what we of what we're doing with this podcast you know you think you're starting with you know you know i think i'm watching a documentary about a team of friends hunting goblins and we're now talking about the god Pan and magic rituals and human sacrifice and Alistair Crowley and Alistair Crowley numerology and, and, and yeah, ciphers, mathematics. And I just like if, if if this had all been mentioned, you know, whilst I was watching episode one, I'd be like, get out of it. What are we talking about? Yeah, how the hell is you gonna get no to that way point? do they get to that point? But lo and behold, like you know, here we are. Here but we are. um but yeah, I think that's um I think that's uh if you agree, I think that's a good good point to uh you know to probably end it that's certainly our certainly our thoughts on season two um Indeed. and you know gives you a, a sort of a summary of where we think you know we're landing on you know the the, the series you know both seasons you know as a, as a whole 
as we've said, you know, we'd implore you to actually go and watch it, you know, for yourselves. Definitely. It's on, um, I think it's available on, on Amazon, on Blu-ray. I think the, the team have just launched it. Um, so definitely invest. It is worth it. You know, if I, I hope is, we've done it. It's still on YouTube as well for free. So yes. if you do it's want to check it out, the original get on release, YouTube. The original launch from way it's back still when there. it's still on uh, YouTube. So yeah, it, hopefully if you've enjoyed our three parts on it, then uh, it's fair to say you'd enjoy the documentary even more. So you know, we've we've kind of been vague over certain things, you know, deliberately. We've not wanted to kind of give everything away because we want to draw your attention to the series, like, you know, like we've enjoyed it, you know, and we think, you know, the guys, we, we owe it to the guys to send people their way, not just to, you know, not just to our work, but to theirs as well, because without them, we wouldn't have had these three episodes. So, Indeed. yeah, please go and watch it if you haven't already. Just if, if for nothing else, then to add context to what we've been waffling on about for, <laughs> six, six hours or whatever it's going to end up being. Uh, I think it's nearly nine hours. Nine hours in total. Yeah. Wow, nearly so, nine hours. Lord of the Rings, mate. Is that, is, yeah, well, we're not doing a director's cut. Christ, <laughs> we do enough commentary as it is. We don't need to do any extras on. Uh, Tell me about it on on that bit. But uh, but no, thank you for sticking with us. For, for you know, for those that have, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope we've brought uh, what is a very compelling case and mystery to you know, to your forefront and um, yeah. And I guess we can, we can, we can leave it there. Um, we have got obviously our, we've got the next episode, you know, thought out, but I think we need to have a little discussion between us as to what it's going to be. I Cause do, I, yeah. I think we've, we've got two possibilities. Um, I think after this one, we might need to rethink what we were going to do <laughs> for so. the next one. So um, we're not going to announce it now, but um, we'll start putting some teasers out on the socials uh, once we've decided which, uh, yeah, as always, is um, at Cryptid Ramblers uh, podcast on uh, Twitter now. We're on, we're on there. Um, we, we're on Facebook, of course. We've got the page on there. We've got the Instagram, all the same handle. Um, and uh, yeah, as we mentioned at the start, we've got the Patreon, where your uh, your support would be uh, would be much appreciated. And uh, we've got the merch store as well, um, be- beautifully modelled by um, Scott and myself on the uh, video for our, our current Patreon. So uh, you're welcome, MK Ultra. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, like I say, I think that's a good place to uh, end it. Anything from you, Scott, to end on? No, no, I think you've pretty much covered it all, really. Um... I think I'll echo your sentiments with with regards to Helia. Absolutely incredible journey. Um, yeah. Watching it first time around a couple of years ago, it was it was incredibly interesting, but I didn't understand it. This yeah. time round, I I understand. I think I understand it. Yeah, and my mind has been blown by it. Yeah, so Agreed. it yeah. it really has. Um, it has changed my perspective on all of this. But um, yeah, okay, that's, yeah all, that's all definitely. I really need to say about it. Um, if, you know, the Helia team do listen to this, it'd be great for you guys to get in contact. Tell us what you thought of our episodes, what, you, you know, if you think that yeah. we've got the right end of the stick or the wrong, the end, wrong of the end of the stick. stick. Yeah, tell us either way, because, yeah, I mean, I, for, just from my own understanding, and I'm sure yours as well, Scott, we'd love to know, whether oh, we're yeah. you know on the money or whether we're you know well off kilter or whether you agree disagree you know for any any other listeners what your thoughts are on it what, how you've interpreted it and yeah honestly any feedback from the team if we're lucky enough to have you yeah. uh, listen and stick with us then yeah please uh, please do get in touch yeah. but, so uh, all the uh, all the links will be in the description for our various different socials and Patreon will. and our merch store as well yeah, but absolutely. it is. In fact, it is goodbye from uh, from me. And it's goodbye from me. And remember, if you go down to the cave today, I probably wouldn't if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what you'll find. <laughs> Too damn right. <laughs> I'm horned gone. Exactly. If you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>